Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Princeton Buffon, Minister of Agriculture, Lands, Housing, and the Environment, Directors of Bank of Montserrat Limited, our distinguished presenters, customers of Bank of Montserrat, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, and to our online viewers, a very good morning to you, and welcome to the Mortgage Symposium hosted by Bank of Montserrat Limited. Before we jump into today's proceedings, just a few housekeeping matters. Um, each presenter will have 20 minutes to do their presentation and then 10 minutes for questions and answers. We prefer if we keep the questions to the question and answer session. I would also ask that we have our cell phones. Let's keep them on vibrate to minimize any disturbance during the presentation. Somewhere around 10 or 10.30 in the morning, we will have some light refreshments. We would prefer not to stop for a break but for persons who may want something to eat, we would encourage you to have something, pick up its prepackaged, take it, and come in, and we can continue while the presentations go on. So having said that, we can now jump into to the symposium. We are delighted to have each and every one of you here today as we embark on a journey towards making our dreams of home ownership a reality. This symposium has been specifically designed to equip you with the knowledge and tools necessary to understand the home construction process from planning to application to disbursement to completion. Our aim today is to empower you with the confidence and understanding required to navigate the often complex world of mortgages and to guide you towards achieving your home ownership goals. Today you will have the privilege of hearing from a very diverse group of presenters who are all experts in their respective fields. They will be sharing valuable insights, practical advice, and useful tips that will undoubtedly provide invaluable, that will undoubtedly prove invaluable as you embark on this exciting journey. From architects and construction professionals to legal experts and loans officers, we have carefully curated a team of individuals who are passionate about assisting you in the quest to place to place to a place you can truly call home. When it comes to planning your dream home, one of the first steps in envisioning what you desire is envisioning what you desire. One of our presenters today, a talented architect, will guide you through the process of visualizing your dream home. He will provide various architectural elements to consider, from room layouts to outdoor spaces, and de detail how these elements come together to create a cohesive and functional living space. Once you have a clear vision in mind, it is vital to understand the financial aspects of turning that vision into reality. Our presenter from the bank will shed light on the mortgage application process, taking you through each step with clarity and simplicity. She will explain the loan application process, the eligibility criteria, and how to make the most compelling case for your mortgage application. Her expert guidance will ensure that you are well prepared to embark on this financial endeavor. Of course, Constructing a home involves more than just blueprints and finances. Our construction professionals will provide invaluable insights into, into the practical aspects of building your dream home. From finding a reliable contractor to understanding the key stages of the construction process, they will empower you to confidently navigate potential obstacles. They will also highlight the importance of establishing clear communication with your contract construction team and how to ensure that your vision is clearly translated into bricks and mortar. Further, our legal experts will address the legal aspects of home ownership. He will demystify the intricacies of property rights, contracts, and the role of legal professionals throughout the home construction process. Armed with this knowledge, you will have a clear understanding of your rights and responsibilities, ensuring a smooth and trouble-free journey towards home ownership. Finally, no symposium would be complete without offering options for green energy especially with the many challenges that we constantly face with the frequent power cuts. Our presenter will share her wealth of experience in green energy and provide you with alternative forms of energy that you can consider. As I conclude my opening remarks, I encourage you to embrace this unique opportunity to gain the knowledge and insight required to navigate the multifaceted mortgage and home construction world. Take full advantage of our incredible lineup of presenters and remember that achieving your, home, achieving your dream home is within your reach. It all begins with the knowledge you will gather here today, combined with your determination and the support of our dedicated team at Bank of Montserrat. 
Once again, I thank you for gracing us with your presence and entrusting us with your dreams. Let the symposium begin, and may this day mark the beginning of an exciting journey towards home ownership for you. I thank you. I now invite the Honorable Princeton Buffon to deliver some very brief remarks on behalf of the Ministry of Housing. Minister. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, everybody. I note the manager said very brief. And I also note he said to some others they have about half an hour or more. I wonder, you know, but I'll leave that alone. Members of the board, general manager, other distinguished guests, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here at this very important symposium, which will focus on the process of building a home for young persons and first-time homeowners on this our beloved island. Congratulations to the Bank of Montserrat, and I do believe that they deserve a round of applause for putting together this wonderful initiative. Educating especially, thank you. Educating especially our young people on home ownership and the process of getting from an idea to an actual home is very important. Maybe if some of us were educated before, we would have made better decisions in building our homes or designing them, myself included. It was the right honorable chief minister, John Osborne, who said that every monstration should own their own home and have a car. And from years ago, we have always been a people, as me and my friend and cousin were speaking about, we have always been a people who prided ourselves in having our homes and building that first home. Maybe it's because of where we were coming from and we knew the importance. But that has been Montserrat for years. For those of us who remember Richmond Hill and Amersham and those places, you can see the pride that was taken in building these homes that are still standing today although they're on the other side, and of course in Alveston as well. However, while this is true, it is equally important for us to understand the real cost in building, and not just building, but in maintaining these homes. This is why a convention or symposium such as this is very important and quite timely. The right to a safe and secure home is a fundamental need. It is also a symbol of stability of growth and personal progress. I firmly believe also that home ownership plays a crucial world, role sorry, in shaping a stronger and a more prosperous society. Not only does it provide an individual with a sense of pride and belonging, but it's also a catalyst for economic development. Now I understand that the road to home ownership can be very daunting from limited financial resources, sourcing materials, choosing those materials, especially in this world of climate change, and we know sometimes that the governors don't last as long. So choosing those materials are very important, and of course, the actual contractor that you choose. I urge all of you here to ask as many questions as possible and to listen to the experts as they outline the very best practices for success. I will leave you with three pieces of advice as you navigate your way through this process. Understand your mortgage options, down payment requirements, and associated costs, especially saving for that initial down payment. Examine your financial preparedness and budgeting for your home. And three, be realistic. Evaluate your financial situation to determine what you can afford to build and what you can afford to maintain. I think someone said your maintenance costs are about 4% of the value after the first four years each year after that. So you can understand the importance of actually maintaining and keeping that value of that home. I encourage you also to check out any government assistance which you may qualify for, like the $40,000 grant, the service lots program, or even the $40,000 duty allowance for building your first home or building that home for rent. These concessions are available. I'm asking you please to go and check them out before you start. 
In closing, just remember that your home is more than just a physical structure. It is an important asset where families are made and where dreams come to life. The ministry responsible for housing, my ministry, will continue to partner with the Bank of Montserrat to offer low-cost housing solutions for first time and other buyers. I want to wish you a very successful showcase or symposium, and I look forward to seeing the start of or a boom in our housing sector after this symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I, I couldn't help note one of your, your closing comments where families are made and dreams become a reality. And you know, this is something that Bank of Montserrat tries to, to help everybody do um, in all that we, we do on a daily basis, help dreams become a reality. Um, I also noted your comments on, on the importance that home ownership will play in shaping a more pros prosperous society with Bank of Montreal in creating affordable opportunities for affordable housing with, um, for our, our people. I look forward to those partnerships and to see how we can work together to push them forward. So thank you, Minister. We appreciate your remarks and the endorsement and for taking the time to be with us so early on the Saturday morning. Thank you. Let's give the Minister a round of applause. Um, our first presenter for today is a representative from Bank of Montserrat, and she's Ms. Amanda Jabatis, our Senior Supervisor Credit. Um, and she will be talking to us about preparing for a mortgage and the loan application process. And we felt it necessary to have her open the baton today, because too often we see people um, thinking about building a home, starting the process, and, and going about it in, in, in the reverse. We see them go in and engage architects and do everything, and then when, when they come to the bank to find out that um, they can't afford what they, they wanted to. So we have scheduled her as our first presenter to open the baton um, so she can walk you through the process and to understand how you should go about planning for your, your home. Amanda, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, and thank you all for being here today. Seeing the side, I'm not seeing the side. Okay. Okay. Again, thank you for being here this morning. Our agenda today: Why own your home? Preparing for home ownership. The home ownership process. The requirements for home ownership qualifying for a mortgage, the mortgage process, and post-construction requirements. Sorry. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. Why own a home? Building or buying a home is one of the most important investments of a lifetime, and some of you can agree with me. It helps increase your net worth. Just by buying a home, you have automatically increased your net worth. It helps build equity. You can use that property for you to purchase maybe another piece of land, maybe to furnish your house, something else. Thank you. If properly maintained, it can increase, your, it can increase the value over time. So once you have a house, and like the minister would have said, maintain that property. You need, you need the funds to maintain that property, right? Once it's maintained, um, you um, continue to keep the value of that property, and over time you can use it again and again. It has the potential to earn additional rental income. A property is a very good investment. 
but it's also a debt. And sometimes persons figure to balance that debt. What they would do is to build a rental property, rental income. So persons would probably build upstairs or build downstairs. So that would um, allow you to earn additional income. Compared to renting, owning a home comes with an additional layer of privacy. So it's yours. You don't have anybody who come in to your house and say they want to do a, a visit to make sure that the property is well kept. It is your home. It is your haven. Preparing for home ownership. Home ownership is a major investment with significant upfront costs. Potential homeowners should properly plan for the home ownership. So you will not just get up this morning and say, oops, I want to build a home. It is something, it's a process. You have to think of that. And in doing so, you have to make sure that you keep your debt, your existing debt, to a minimal when applying for a loan. You have to ensure you build a savings reserve to handle unexpected construction expenses. Once building a home, there are expenses that comes with it. Plan for what's affordable and not what, um, and not what, and not for the lifestyle of others, sorry. Okay, so live within your means. Do not figure, okay, I should have a home because my friend has this home, or this person has this home, I want to be like them. Live within your means. The home ownership process. The very first step is to ensure you consult your bank to determine how much you can afford. This is very important. Persons usually figure, okay, I want a house and I, sh I should get this house for a million dollars or $800,000. Can you afford that amount? So the first step is to visit your bank. Ident thereafter, after you have been told how much you can afford, you will go to your architect to get a design done for your house. And you have to ensure that you stay within your budget. Tell your architect, I would like to get a house for a particular amount based on what your banker has told you. Get the cost for constructing the house from a certified valuator. This is very important. Based on the ECCB guidelines and um, the bank's guidelines, valuator should be recertified. So we have to ensure that you have a certified valuator to give you a valuation. Identify and engage a reputable contractor who is competent and who has the financial capacity. You want to ensure that whoever is going to be building your home for you can build a proper home, can build a steady home, because this is usually a very, this is a very um, big investment. So you want to ensure that uh, the person who's doing it for you is doing it well, and the person is re reputable. We often see that persons, um, contractors build homes for persons. Sometimes they take your money and they use it for another job. You do not want that. So you want to ensure that person is reputable. You also want to ensure that that person has the financial capacity to be able to do so, and so they wouldn't use your monies to do another job. All right? I'm sure you can agree with me, persons who have gone through the process. After you have done that, you will re-engage your financial institution to apply for financing. Beginning construction of your home, you firstly have to understand the plan that you have been given. Understanding your plan will ensure that you do not have any issues when constructing your home. Then you ensure that you know what goes where, and then no changes are done. And like I said, avoid changes to the original plan. There are cost implications if changes are done to the plan. So understand the cost implications for any changes that are done to your plan. Just by putting an extra two feet would cost Money. Some persons may not necessarily think, oh, it's just one feet or two feet. No, it does cost. And you have to ensure that you limit um, any changes to the plan because at the end of the day, it can prevent you from actually completing your home. If there are changes to be done, if there is something significant that has been highlighted, the first thing to do is to contact your bank. 
when you contact your bank, they can indicate to you what can and can be done and if there are any cost implications. There are situations where maybe the loan can be refinanced at a later date. If not, then the cost would have to be borne by you. Requirements for a mortgage. When applying for a mortgage, ensure you have the following items. Valid identification, a recent utility bill, recent job letter from your employer, recent salary slip, proof of other forms of income, a statement of affairs, and a statement of income and expenditure. The last two would be given to you. The statement of affairs and um, statement of income and expenditure statement will be um, done by the bank. So you'd come to the bank and we would take the re relevant information from you to actually be able to fill that. A statement of savings balances with other institutions. And I will also say maybe your loan balance as well. We do do a credit check, but however, um, if you do have that information, it will be helpful. Evidence of property title. Uh, it's in the form of a deed, and I think here you'll use the land certificate. Evidence of life insurance. Approval from physical planning unit. Qualifying for a mortgage. To qualify for a mortgage, a borrower must satisfy the following. You must have good character. You shouldn't have any history of delinquency, and you should be in stable employment. One must have the capacity to repay. And in order for us to assess that, you have to ensure your debt service ratio is no more than 45%. Now, we use a benchmark of 45% to ensure that persons are able to live after they pay their loan. So it's a 45-55% ratio. Imagine you are paying a loan, and it is more than 50-55% of your income. If something happens, if you're sick, what happens? You would eat first before you pay the loan. So when the bank says to you, it's 45%, Persons don't normally understand that. They say, but I can pay more. But you don't look at the big picture. At the end of the day, you have to have a balance, just in case something happens. Ability to meet post-construction requirements. After you have gone through the whole process, you have to ensure that you have the ability to reach, to be able to pay your insurances and other costs which comes up. You must have the capital requirement, which is a deposit of 5%. This persons usually say, I don't have the money. And that is when you have to actually think of the process before you just approach the bank. You must have a deposit. This builds immediate equity into your property. It gives you a stake into what you're actually going into. Collateral. The security of, it should have security of equal value or more than the mortgage. Now. When you're first building a home, you may not necessarily have collateral up front unless you actually own the property. And if you own your land, then you have immediate equity, you have collateral. When you have, um, when you have built your home, like I said earlier, you can use that property to mortgage it for something else that you would want to acquire. Adequate insurance coverage. And the insurances would be both your life and your house insurance. The mortgage process. The mortgage process consists of three critical phases. The first phase is the application phase. Customers must have an application with the bank. Customers must bring all the required documentation that is being given to you. So there's a checklist of requirements. And um, any of you would want one, we have a checklist downstairs. Customers must meet all the approval conditions. Perfection of security. Your salary must be assigned, and you must take a charge over the property. So there's a legal charge over the property that you're actually going to be. So whatever you're constructing, a charge is going to be taken over that property. That, is, that will be our security. Insurances must be in place, both life and house insurance. It is important. Some persons, I realize here, are reluctant to take insurance because of past experience, but it is important. Life insurance. Life and construction insurance, yes. Um, life insurance is important for 
for in the event something happens to you as an individual, your family actually is able to get your property, God forbid, but your family is able to get your property, your life insurance will actually pay off your debt. For construction insurance, if something happens to your property, a hurricane, um, some kind of disaster, and you're covered, you can get funds to rebuild your property. And so that is the significance of actually having the insurances in place. The disbursement phase. Disbursement will be made on, will be made at the following phases. Mobilization, substructure, superstructure, and finishings. Mobilization is what is given to you when you get your first drawdown. So this is given to you for cleaning the site, building your shed and whatnot. Your substructure would be your columns and your platform. Your superstructure would be from your platform up, up until your roof. Your finishings would be your internal items, your plastering, your electricals, your painting. Post-construction requirements. Post-construction requirements would consist of compulsory savings. And we do compulsory savings for one or two reasons. Um, for the saving towards your insurances at the end of the year, your, your house insurance. And there are some situations where savings might be um, asked to be done, depending on the customer's situation. It may be because of the type of job you're in and then you, you're, you're, you're on a contract and maybe your contract would take, and we realize your contract would not be renewed within a particular period of time because I've had the experience where there are teachers who work on contractual basis and at the end of a period of time, um, before the contract is renewed, this customer would have an issue in actually paying the loan at the end of that contractual period. So having a savings account, in, um, a savings in place, would help a, as a buffer towards that. So you can use those funds to actually pay your insurance, to actually pay your loan, sorry. Life insurance and credit life insurance. These two are important, like I mentioned before. Um, your life insurance is, is on your life, a credit life insurance is also on your life, but it's for the term of the loan. Property insurance. Updated valuations every three years. I realize persons don't like to do valuations here, I guess because of the cost, but this is important. It is important for the bank to know the value of their security because we are holding it as security. And it's important for you as an individual to know the value of your security. So if your property is well maintained, then you shouldn't have an issue. Annual Statement of Affairs and Income and Expenditure Statement. This is what is taken from you that will actually list all of your, your expenses and your assets and your liabilities. This is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me later. Thank you very much. If we have any questions for Ms. Jabatis, now is the time to ask them. <laughs> I noticed she seemed a little nervous. I just, on, towards the end of her presentation, she spoke on, on life insurance and credit life insurance, and I'm not sure many people understand the difference between the life and the credit life. Um, many of us would probably take out insurance on our life. Um, if, if that is assigned to the bank, and in the event of death, the insurance company would pay that life insurance towards the bank. It would then mean that if you have family that you have left behind, young children that you have left behind, rather than those proceeds going towards their upkeep and education and, and, and ensuring they continue to, to live a, a decent life, it goes towards paying, paying the mortgage. The difference with credit life insurance is that credit life insurance would settle the outstanding balance on the loan. So if at the time of application, your loan is $500,000 and you die a year later, it would wipe out the $500,000 or, or the balance of the loan at the time of death. If you pass away um, in year 19 of a 20 year mortgage and the balance on your loan is $10,000, the credit life insurance would clear $10,000 balance. Um, most persons tend to think, well, why should I, I, I take credit life insurance when I already have life insurance? Um, 
credit life insurance is significantly cheaper than, than the payments for, for life insurance. Um, and it allows you to keep your life insurance policy um, for the benefit of those that you, you may leave, be, leave behind. And while the credit life insurance will take care of, of, of the mortgage, the balance on your mortgage loan, I strongly encourage people to, to give consideration to that um, because it can certainly make life a lot easier, for, well, not for you, but for those that you leave, leave behind. I, I hate to sound that way, but um, I've seen too many instances where um, people have assigned their life insurance, it clears out the mortgage, and then they, they have young children that are left to, to um, at the mercy of, 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 of other people. So thank you very much, Amanda. Um, very insightful presentation. Let's give Amanda a round of applause. Now, I, I spoke in my earlier remarks of, of the very skilled architect. Our next presenter is Mr. Kenneth Castle. Um, Mr. Castle is a monstration born architect and a relative with offices located at the airport um, road in Gerald's. After attending university in Toronto, Canada and Stonefield, Michigan, he returned home in 1986 with a Bachelor of Technology in Architectural Science, as well as a Bachelor of Archi Architecture and set up his architectural practice with his first office located on Marine Drive in Plymouth. Today, with over 37 years of experience in the field of building design and construction, he is a principal architect and managing director of KJ Castle Consultants Limited, one of the leading architectural firms here on the island. He is also the managing director of Tropical Island Real Estate Limited. KJ Castle Consultants Limited has evolved from its early focus on the design and supervision of residential type projects to providing the full complement of design services and project management on a broad range of project types, including residential, institutional, educational, commercial, and religious developments across Montserrat and several neighboring islands. The company's notable clients include the government of Montserrat, the Caribbean Development Bank, the European Union, the University of the West Indies, the Roman Catholic Church, and the um, Diocese of St. John's Bastia, and the Financial Services Commission, just to name a few. KJ Consultants continues to play a significant role in Montserrat, in Montserrat's redevelopment and the reboot of the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Kenneth Castle. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Good morning to everybody. Yes, I'm here to speak to you about designing your home. And uh, just want to have a conversation uh, to present a few tips and guidelines. About good home design. <clears throat> Any major project we embark on in life should be well planned. Proper planning saves time, saves money, reduces stress, stress for, from, from doing construction work, designing your home, building your home can be very intense. So it's, it's key to try to reduce stress. Your new home is likely to be your, your largest investment, so it's important that we plan wisely. Just to speak briefly about early planning. <clears throat> One of the first things you're going to do when you um, embark on this journey is to choose a lot. And some of the tips I give my clients point out that it's important to choose a lot that doesn't have any drainage issues. In other words, avoid guts or drainage channels. If, if there's going to be a gut near the property, make sure that it doesn't impact the, up, up the property adversely, right? Look for a moderate slope. Slope is key to um, design and design costs. We'll talk more about that a bit later. Consider the volcanic zone that you're in, because um, some people feel more comfortable being further, further north. But these days, that's so much an issue, as especially since we have had ash for about 10 years, right? 
So, but, that, but considering the volcanic zone is important. Compare the cost of your options and also consider the view that you have from the property. Views add value. One of the other important steps is to choose an architect or designer. Now, people often make the mistake of underestimating the value of good design. Inefficient design can actually end up costing you twice the design fees in building costs. Right? If you don't have a proper design, if you have an inefficient design, it can end up inflating the cost of, your, of, of what you're building. So choose an architect and a design technician with good schooling and experience. Another key issue is setting an affordable budget. I've seen a lot of projects stall because uh, financing or budgeting was an issue. The cost of the property end up being more than what the builder can afford, the, the property owner can afford. So first, choose a bank. If you're getting good advice right here from, from Bank of Montserrat. Shop around, review the options for loan, in, in loan terms and interest, and then decide one which, which, on one which best suits you, suits you or serves you. Speak to your loans officer, determine what you can afford to, to borrow. You should also seek advice from your architect or designer about building costs. Set a budget and work with it. Set your budget based on your assets and available financing. Now let's talk a little bit about in-depth planning and design. Designing for slopes. As I earlier mentioned, the topography of your site can, will in fact impact the cost of your property, the cost of what you build. In Montserrat, it's a challenge because most lots are, 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 slo are sloping significantly, some gentle, some not so gentle. Steeper sloping land means higher costs of construction. Sometimes it may be better to buy a lot that costs a bit more, but has a gentle slope, right? Um, because then your foundations will be shorter, less expensive. Otherwise, you may end up with spending thousands of dollars on taller foundations with enough space for a basement that you really didn't plan for or didn't really want. So it's, it's important to consider that. Now, in terms of designing the house itself, <clears throat> Avoid waste space. Don't get caught up with long hallways and get carried away with large rooms. Work to your means, work to your budget, but make sure the structure is strong and be, mi but be mindful of over-designing. Sometimes some of the structural designs that are done, people do sort of copycat designs and end up with foundations, for example, that have unnecessary walls, etc., costing a lot more. Balance quality with affordability. Quartz and granite countertops are of a great quality, but may not be in your, within your budget. Do some research with your designer in choosing materials, especially finishes and fixtures, which may have an impact, a significant impact on the overall cost of your property, of what you build. Allow for natural ventilation. Cross ventilation design is key in any house, household, any home you build. Make sure that your windows are positioned to maximize airflow. This way you avoid having the need for air conditioning, which is a uh, you know, high energy cost. If you're stuck with a basement space, then make it a part of the house and reduce the upper floor. Plan for it, reduce the upper floor, plan your basement into the space. Maybe even turn it into an apartment which you can rent and help pay for your mortgage. I think Amanda touched on that before. Continue with design of your house. Design for hurricanes is key. We live in a high exposed hurricane zone, also in an earthquake zone. So structural design is very key to uh, any structure, in any building, any house that you build. We advise people to go with short roof overhangs, well-anchored rafters, 
and even consider going with concrete roofs. Concrete roofs have become more popular recently, especially after Hurricane Hugo, um, when we see how you know, timber roofs tend to get ripped off if they're not designed and anchored properly. Make sure you meet the requirements for planning approval. Pay attention to key design issues such as the layout and setbacks, structural strength, safe electrical wiring, sewage treatment, and fire safety. All these are things that the, the different departments in government look for um, when, when they're vetting plans for planning approval. Design for low maintenance. Maintenance is a, is a major challenge in any, any, for any property owner. Keeping a house or building in good condition costs money. But your design can also help you reduce that cost. You and your designer should make wise choices when it comes to selecting materials. For example, if you're in a corrosive area like Lookout, you'd want to select materials, metals that are more corrosion resistant. Designed for also for low energy consumption. Energy costs a lot these days, um, and there are some options which, although the upfront cost is, is additional, it pays back over time. Photovoltaics or solar power is now a more efficient and affordable way to go when, as for, for, for su supplying power to your home. Obviously, um, most people are not going to put in a full um, solar bank in, their, in their, their homes, but you could do some to control the outside lighting or part of the home or even just for backup power, right? So consider that when, when designing your home and when planning your home. Use of low E glass, when you're selecting your glass windows, make sure that they, they have the, the reflective film that reduces um, solar intake. And again, try to maximize with natural ventilation. That will, again, as I said, reduce the cost of electricity consumption. Reducing the need for fans, all the fans are critical and important, and reducing the need for AC. Aim for good aesthetic, aesthetics. A lot of times we build houses or homes that really not very attractive, and it really pains me to see some of what we've done. We've done some good work here in Monsat, but we could do better in some cases, and if you just pay a little more attention to, to design and aesthetics, and this is a challenge for any architect or designer to you know, make what you do look good. So I encourage homeowners to pay ad adequate attention to roof and exterior design. Plan for expansion. Consider building your house in phases, Add a basement or extra bedroom in phase two when you can afford to. Again, you may not be able to afford the whole layout of the house that you want um, up front, but if you plan it in fa and phase it, as time goes by, you may be able to find yourself in a position that phase two becomes a reality. Get a cost estimate from your proposed design, for your proposed design, and check your budget. Design, decide on whether to expand or cut back and leave, leave some of the additional space for phase two. I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about construction. I know the topic is coming up in more depth, but just want to touch on a few things. <clears throat> Decide, for example, on whether to go for what type of contract you want to enter into. Some people are in the position to help themselves by procuring the materials themselves, so a labor contract may, they, may be the way to go, as opposed to going with a full labor and materials contract. But you have to make sure that you have enough time and energy um, to, to manage the procurement of materials and so forth. And this can be done with ad advice of your designer or architect. And your bank may also have something to say here if you're doing a, 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 a financed um, a mortgage, then you know you may want to have that conversation with the bank about that option. Be sure to use a proper building contract document. A lot of big times people do verbal or nondescript agreements, but it's important to outline all the responsibilities of both parties, agree on progress payments, and again, the bank, your bank will have something to say there. Ensure that you get quality workmanship from your contractor. 
This is key, again, in terms of maintenance and quality of, and life of the, of, the, of the building that you build going forward. It is also important to control changes to the scope of works. Contract variations can add, add up and break your budget. Be sure to involve your design architect for guidance or any other, if you have a contractor that you trust and, you know, um, that you can seek advice from, you know, but try to control changes that would impact seriously the, on the cost of the project. Finally, just to touch on furnishing and decorating, this is uh, something that people quite often forget to include in their budgets. What is important to plan for your furniture, you have to have, you have, to have furniture in the house and you have to have appliances. And also, it would be good to put up some nice curtains and add some decor, some flavor to the property. So, you know, my advice is balance quality with affordability, but try to make it nice. In conclusion, building your new home in Monsford is a major challenge. Please don't underestimate it. It's a lot of work, could be stressful, but it can be fun. If you, and, it, and the end product is very rewarding. So to avoid major headaches, major cost overruns, it's important to plan wisely and build smart. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, do we have any questions for Mr. Kasser? I, I will probably start with the first in case you're a little nervous. Um, Mr. Kasser, you know, when I travel, I notice um, in some countries there's a tendency to use a lot of drywall on the interior of structures as opposed to the concrete that I'm assuming is a little more expensive. If, yeah, drywall. If we are looking to keep the cost of construction down for potential homeowners, um, what are the likely implications for considering alternative forms of construction, like the drywall on the interior of the buildings, to help keep the cost of the project down, if it is actually cheaper? Drywall is, is actually much cheaper than, than doing masonry walls. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have so many high-skilled artisans here to, to do drywall quickly and effectively. And a lot of, a lot of contractors prefer to do masonry. And as I've done, for example, the Red Cross building up on Braids. Um, we had drywall partitions inside. The contractor opted to switch them to <laughs> concrete block and plastered concrete block. So, you know, it, it, but, you know, I have a villa in, 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 um, in Alveston and you know, this was built years ago. I use drywall because, you know, cost, it saves costs. It uh, gives some flexibility. But some people don't like drywall because of the noise, the sound transition. If you don't insulate them well, the, the uh, sound transition can, you know, is noticeable. You can hear voices from one room to the other to some extent. So there, there are pros and cons to, to the drywall. But certainly it is cheaper. Thank you, Mr. Castle. Questions? <coughs> Nothing else for Mr. Castle? Okay. That's a sign that you probably were very clear in your presentation, Mr. Castle, or you had them totally lost. I was able to follow, so I assume everybody was able to do so. So thank you very much. Um, and um, for that, that very educational and informative presentation. Um, I think it's one of the critical things that in, in any home ownership process that we really have to take time to assess who we, we engage to design our home for us. Um, too often, you know, we, we, we engage people who design homes for us um, and we have to remember every time we drive home on an afternoon and we go down our driveway or go up our driveway, that's, that's home and we want to have no regrets when we, we, we drive home. We don't want to be looking at a house and ask ourselves, but is that what I'm buying my, or paying my $500,000 loan for? Make sure you choose a proper architect who can give you a very good design 
that will make you want to come home on an afternoon after a hard day's work. So, Mr. Castle, thank you for your presentation. Let's give Mr. Castle a round of applause. Our next presentation is on the legal aspects of, of home ownership, and, and that is usually a very complex area. There are many aspects, um, legal aspects regarding low, low, um, home ownership from, from um, the, the mortgage um, or the application process when we have to do the mortgage. Sometimes we are building in, in, in a husband and wife situation, one partner may be building, what are the implications for the other one? Um, there, there are many, many different aspects. Um, we, we are hoping today that Mr. Buffon will shed some light on the whole um, legal aspects of, of home ownership. Um, Mr. Fitzroy Buffon completed his law degree in 2007 at the University of Northumberland, Newcastle in the United Kingdom. He was called to the English Bar in 2010 and went on to complete a year of pupillage in Holborn um, Chambers in Holborn, United Kingdom. Before entering private practice, Mr. Buffon worked at the Government of Montserrat's Attorney General's Chambers from 2011 to 2015. He is currently the owner of Buffon & Associates, located in Olveston, where they specialize in civil cases. Ladies and gentlemen, please join in welcoming Mr. Fitzroy Buffon. Good morning, all. I intend to focus my presentation on four areas. One, the importance of carrying out proper searches, overriding interests and their impact, and the contract, which we call the, the sales agreement, and lastly, co-ownership. Right, so first up, typically a client may contact me and say, look, I am interested in buying a house, or I'm interested in buying a piece of land. What do I need to do? Well, I would basically want to get the information from that person, the name of the person you're buying the land from or the house, block and parcel number. Once you give me that, I'm happy because I'll attend the land registry to conduct a search. Now, it's very important to conduct searches because there's a Latin phrase, caveat emptor. And what that simply means is, buyer beware. Well, the effect of that is that if you don't carry out searches and you end up owning property that has other interests, your interest will be secondary and not primary. Very, very important. So I would have gone through the land registry Pick up the block and parcel number, look at the name, see if it's correct. Confirm whether there are any encumbrances at all on the property. There may be leases, there may be easements, there may be cautions, there may be prior charges by other banks, all these factors. Because no institution would want to have another charge on the property when somebody's coming to look a loan from the bank. They want it clear and free. So part of my task is to ensure that one, the client is getting what he or she wants, clear title, no issues. And sometimes we overlook issues such as land locking. So you go and buy a piece of land, and you realize there's no road. You can't get to the land. What do you do? I know of a situation in, um, not too far from here, 25 years, a client of mine have land, he can't get to it. But something has to be wrong with that, and I believe Maybe physical planning should have intervened to say, look, we must have a road here. There's no point having the land and you cannot access it. So the inspection at land registry reveals a lot of detail. It will indicate, for example, who owns the land, how long the person owns it, how he holds it, if there's a mortgage, or who had a mortgage before, all that information is there. So you don't have to worry at all. Now, my approach to advising clients about buying land or house is that we have to do it right. If you're buying land, I would want to advise that you get a certified surveyor, survey the boundaries, so you know, this is my boundary. 
Don't take the risk of assuming that this is the boundary. We've done a lot in Mansha. Or say, this, this tree is the boundary. It's not a tree. There must be a marker for the boundary. So I don't advise that you do it yourself, because you may not know what you're looking for. Engage a surveyor is not a lot of money. I think they probably charge uh, $150 for each point. It's worth it. And you look at the risk you're running. If it's a house, very early I would want to have a structural engineer engage. Go and examine the house, do a report for me to assess. And if you get another mortgage from a bank, the bank will insist that the report is done anyway. But I want one as well. So I've done my search, I want the report. I'm trying to prepare the, the sales agreement. Now, lawyers are not trained to do certain things. I can find a marker though. But if there's a crap in the house, I'll see the crap, but I don't know the extent of the crap. So the structural engineer is the one who's the expert in that area. And the certified surveyor is the one who's going to say, look, these are the boundaries. You pay for 10,000 square feet of land, this is it. The purchaser often inspects the property. And the purchaser might say, I like the house. But the purchaser does not quite understand sometimes whether you're getting value for money. You like the house, and it's 500,000 US. But like the house, you have to look at it. Is it worth it? So sometimes clients call me and say, look, I want your opinion. I'll visit the site. I'm no expert, but I have a good idea of taste. So if I see 500,000, I'm looking for certain things. If I don't see them, I say no. Start at 250, 300. So failure to inspect, even from the structural engineer's standpoint, is a problem. Because the buyer will have constructive notice of what is there. And the effect is you take your property subject to it. Now, there are two types of defects. You hear of um, patent defects, you heard of latent defects. And patent defects are really those that are discoverable by the human eye. So you come and you see a crack, okay. But then there are latent defects, which you may not be able to discover. And you may find that, um, for example, you're interested in buying a house, but they use um, three-eight steels in building columns when in fact it should be half inch. No, you won't know, all right? And sometimes the sellers make representations in trying to sell the property, say a lot of things. That is important for me. I need to know what they're saying because if what they're saying is not true, then my client have a ground to challenge the sale if things don't work out. Now, the unfortunate thing about that is you are challenging the sale doesn't mean you're gonna avoid the contract. It may mean that in such circumstances, you might be entitled to a discount. So instead of paying um, 250,000, you might pay um, 225, having regard to certain things. So don't think you're gonna just walk away because there's a problem. Because the principle I outlined before, caveat emptor, don't ever forget it. Buyer, beware. Something is wrong here. You can move it to me. Okay. Now, you may ask, why do we do these inspections? Are they necessary? Well, they are very necessary. Because even though I went down to the land registry, I will never find all I need. And there's a culprit we call overriding interests, which I want to really delve in now. Because it's something we take for granted, but it always comes back to hurt us if we're not careful. So you go to the land registry, you will not find overriding interests. Over overriding interests are set out as section 28 of the registered land act in Montreal. And of particular significance is item G. So 28G, at some point you could look at it, but it sets out a list of overriding interests, but the one I'm really concerned about is 28G. And it refers to the rights of, of a person in occupation of land or in receipt of rent except where such inquiry is made of such person and the rights are not disclosed. Understand it? I can break it down. So the person must have a right. And in Montreal, we tend to think that occupation is a right. Occupation is not a right. 
Don't forget that. Mere occupation of land is not a right. So let's look at how the right exists. I could tell you I did a case probably two years ago where a client of mine took the risk, bought some land, did not engage a surveyor, did not do any physical inspection himself, and he got in some problems. Because the neighbor next door is saying, look, I've been living on this, occupying this portion of land for over 12 years, and therefore he's entitled to the overriding interest in his favor. So he went to court, took my client to court, and I got the papers. And when I did the calculation, it amounted to 11 years and 10 months. I said, ah, good. Not going anywhere. So we've been in court for about four years. We had to prevail. Because his argument was, I occupy the land. But you occupy the land, but you have not a right. The right crystallizes after 12 years. 11 years and 10 months, you're shot at two months. So we won. We were in court for like four years, and it's really a waste of time sometimes. I was trying to settle it because I told the guy, listen, you have a case. Let's forget about it and tell me a little thing and move on. He said, no. He got two different liars telling him what they told him. Still lost. So those overriding interests, you'll never find them except you inspect the property itself. So when my client came to me and I went to the land, I realized there was an area of land about 20 feet on his side running for the whole breadth of the property. A fence was placed there. And I suspect that the fence was placed there sometime just before. The argument to the other side, I have this fence there. I got it from the owner, original owner, but you can't prove it. So the point is, you really have to pay attention. And that's why I say engage experts who understand. Because had he done the inspection, you would have raised suspicions. There's a fence? Why is there a fence? So you overlook that. Now, the other thing is, Time stops running when you, the matter reaches the court. It doesn't matter who takes the matter to court. So I'm trying to move the person off the land, for example. I take it out in court. Take the matter to court, time stops running for him too. So even if he has 11 years, 11 months, 20 days, I take out action in court, time stops running. And I can still succeed. What you must never do is to allow anyone to occupy for more than 12 years. It's difficult to do, but if you go away, you should have somebody here looking after your business. Because if somebody's occupying, you should see it. But it's not so easy, because the argument is a fence. And the house is on the other side. He said he cut the yard, he plants everything. So look at it that way. Um, those who are interested, they could look at the case of um, Joseph Molyneux versus Dwayne Hickson. That's the same case we're talking about. Interesting read. And you, you flag up a number of issues that you probably would not. I um, appreciate. But there's another category of personal occupation that you need to pay attention to. I'm thinking of a hypothetical situation now where a husband and wife purchase land. The wife's name is not on the title deed, only the husband. There may be one situation where the wife paying all the bills to allow him to pay the mortgage and all the household chores. That's one situation. The other one is she's paying half, but because his name alone is on the title deed, he plans to sell it, unknown to her. Now remember now, and it's a distinguishing feature. The situation I outlined before was one where you had to spend 12 years to crystallize. This one, there's no need to spend 12 years, because she has a right. And the right arose from paying utilities, paying the mortgage, notwithstanding your name is not on the title deed. So the husband is trying to run a fast one, sell the land, probably move on. What she has to do now is to, if you're parking, you know, keep your eyes open, and you lodge a caution. And the caution will prohibit and inhibit all mm -hmm. actions with that property. It happens all the time. It's nothing new. And, um, it's not to say that the men are always the ones who are doing it, because um, there are situations where women do it as well. So it's a two-sided thing, but you have to keep your eyes open and pay attention, because that right arose from either contributions, direct or indirect. With the other circumstance, it's not contribution issue, it's occupation issue. If the wife is not living in the house, she has a problem. 
If you look back at the provision, he explains to you that you must be in occupation. So the rights of the person in occupation. If the wife doesn't live there, she's not in occupation. And she has to find another recourse to get the money. That's to sue the husband. All right? So you keep your eyes open. Uh, I'm not suggesting that all married people will do something, but um, just keep your eyes open. You also have a situation um, where under Section 135 of the Register Land Act, person may seek to claim uh, what we call prescription. Why it is just really peaceable, uninterrupted occupation of land for 12 years without the permission of anyone entitled. People often try that as well. And it's sad because family members try it all the time. But you will not work with family members easily because if you trace back generations, somebody gave somebody permission. So somebody might have given your great grandmother permission to occupy. And you're claiming now your grandmother, great grandmother occupied the land. But it's still permission. And permission defeats prescription. Don't forget that. Defeats it. And even with the situation I outlined before, if anybody gave anybody permission, they cannot come and claim. It's only when there is no permission, yes, that you can claim. But even in the Section 135 um, situation, it's not automatic. So even if you say, look, I believe I'm entitled to play, claim prescription, you still have to apply to the registrar. You don't apply, nothing happens. And the registrar has to publish for six weeks and she has to notify people affected, so you still don't know. And it's for the registrar to determine now whether, having regard to all the evidence that came up, whether this person should get it or not. Let me focus now on the contract of sale, because it's very important. Don't ignore it. And what's happening now is a lot of people have been drying up their own sales contract to the detriment. And people in Manchester are not as vigilant as they should be, but I'm warning people. Drafting a sales contract is not hard, but it's technical. And if you don't know what you're doing, just take in some from somebody, say, look, I'm using this. You could get any problems. Why? Let's look at it. So this client is going to apply for a land owning license. Um, they're going to try and get a loan from the bank. The sales agreement has to reflect a number of things. Names of the parties, black and parcel number. If there's a deposit, what's the deposit? Yeah? Um, timeline to close. If it's 90 days, it's 90 days. It could be less, but that's a ballpark figure. But sometimes you run in error not inserting clauses that are necessary. And the generic sales agreement you have is defective from the start. Because if you're selling me land, if I'm selling land, and you don't insist that, listen, the sale is contingent on me getting a mortgage from Bank of Montreal. It doesn't include it. Well, look at the problems you have. 90 days gone, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a deposit. Because that's the timeline. But if you inserted, for example, it is subject to me getting a loan from Bank of Montreal. Where the loan, the loan fails, that's the end of it. I have to get my deposit. But if you leave it out, it goes. Now, fortunately, we're not as litigious. We're generally good Christian people. But don't take that for granted and think that you're right. All right? There's another provision about um, land owning license. We make the mistakes all the time. This client is buying land. You don't have no provision, no clause in the agreement referring to the need to obtain a land owning license. Same thing. I'm coming for a deposit, I want it, because that's your problem, that's not mine. So be very careful about drafting things on your own, leaving out critical information, it can cost you. And um, things are changing. So you have to ensure you have that in. Now, particularly when you're buying houses, it's not just the house you're buying. You're buying the land, you're buying the house, and quite often you want the contents of the house. That must be included in the sales agreement. If it's not in there, it can't be implied. If you're spending $500,000 and you, the, the seller is saying, you know what? All the things I have cost about $80,000. you are talking about US. And um, you didn't put it in. 
You can't imply it. You take the house of 500,000 without no contents. So look at these things. And that's why you need legal advice, because it's critical. Again, people made mistakes, and the owners said, look, you know what? I'll deal with it. But it doesn't hold true. It's going to work all the time. Now, when somebody defaults, you're liable to you lose the deposit, which is normally 10%. But where the vendor defaults, as a person who is selling the land, when he defaults, you're just entitled to the return of the deposit. And maybe, maybe some damages. Not sure. So understand that. When you're wrong, all the deposit goes, forfeited. When the vendor is wrong, just give you back your deposit. And it works out most times. So you as the purchaser have to stay on top of things. Now, the sales agreement is really a contract. It sounds complex, but it's not really complex. Offer, acceptance, consideration. Offer is really a, a situation where somebody is saying to you, I'm, I want to sell you this. Acceptance is unqualified assent to the terms of the offer. Consideration is really giving something for something. So money or money is what? You could decide, I don't want money, I want 10 horses, I want something else on you. It doesn't matter. So you look at this. I want to move now to um, where have we got that? Right. So land cannot be sold orally, but there are exceptions. And one exception is really you know having an auction. Nobody comes and says I'm making an offer. It happens because at the fall of the hammer, it moves on. But generally, you have to have it in writing. You can't tell me, take the house and give me the money. That's not it. It must be in writing. It must be in the form of a deed. And even when I spoke earlier about the contents of the house, even those contents with the chattels have to be in a deed. We call it a deed of assignment. So you're buying the house. All the items in the house are listed. You sign. Both parties sign. Notarized. They're yours but not until then. So I want to now move to um, right, it's a very interesting area. When two or more persons own property, it's very important, as a critical, that you choose the right mode and there are consequences for not doing the right thing. So there are two types of co-ownership. Um, there's the tenants in common, which I'll explain, and there's giant tenancy. Tenants in common exists where three of us buying land, 30%, 30%, whatever. That's tenants in common. And with giant tenancy, all of our names are there, but none of us None of us own a separate interest. Understand that. Nobody owns a separate interest. All of us own all of it, but no separate interest. The consequence is this. If you choose the wrong mode, and it doesn't work out right for you, you're basically finished. So imagine Joseph and I bought the house $1 million. We didn't take legal advice. We have it in joint tenancy. And Joseph has five children, wife, married, everything. Joseph dies. I don't want to see him laughing, but I'm happy because all the property is now mine. His family cannot get involved because they chose the wrong mode. That might be good in family situations, but be very careful even with, with that. Co-ownership is a better route because you have what we call undivided shares. So you can say 30% for Joseph, that's yours, 30%. 30% for X, 40% for X, good. That share passes under your intestacy or under your will. But the opposite is not true. With joint tenancy, it can't pass under the will. It can only pass to the person who you own it with. And I wanna say there's a 
lacuna in our law. And that's why I say, be very careful about choosing giant tenancy. Now, theoretically, you should be able to go and say, look, I want to sever it and turn it from giant tenancy to tenancy in common. Not so easy. The other party, most of the time, have to consent. So it's the risk we run to, putting our children's name on the property, thinking, oh, we, we, we're a family. Family changed. They go to the university, pick up different ideas, decide, you know what? Forget about my father. We're not changing anything. He can't change it. And it's true. But in the UK, it's not like that. Because under the provision, I could simply serve notice on you and say, look, I'm severing, and he severed right away. Severed or by a course of dealing or taking court action, it's severed right away. So be very careful about it because all provision is not like that. And um, except for Barbados and Belize, who adopt the pre-1926 English provision, be very, very careful about seeking to sever. We have the Partition Act, we have the Register Land Act, but there's a lacuna. There's, there's, a, there's not a remedy. I think in the public interest, that needs to be looked at and amended because it's not really fair. So I always recommend tenants in common. It's more practical, it's fairer, and to my mind, giant tenancy should only work with people who are genuine Christians. <laughs> because you expect them to see God when they're taking a decision. But don't take it when people are not. Because people change. Uh, and you started off in good faith. And then midway through you realize everybody changed and you stop. What do you do? Same thing when you have your children on entitled deed. Even with tenants in common. Be careful too. They still need consent. All right? And if they decide they're not consenting, you may want to go to court and say, look, issue the shares. You can do that. But with the other one, like I said, there's a defect in the law which does not permit what you want done. So be careful about it and keep your eyes open. So don't forget, tenants in common, no right to survivorship, passes under your will, and intestacy. Giant tenancy can't pass under your will. You only pass to the survivor. And you know, you think of situations sometimes where a family is traveling to the States and you see the husband and wife leave this afternoon. Why? Good reason. Uh, tomorrow morning, the remainder goes. Some people just don't travel together because they understand um, the law is on errors. No, it's true. There's something we call um, common calamities. And um, so the entire family travels, right? And um, let's say giant tenancy. Plane crashes, for example. Everybody dies. Who gets? Well, the presumption that the youngest person gets. Even the youngest person die last in that crash. The presumption that the youngest person takes, takes off. So sometimes you see person traveling is a reason why they travel that way. They don't want everybody to. Right? right? So we've got the contract, which I draft now, have all the information, drafted it get the two parties to sign, have it notarized, all right? And um, I would prepare a, a draft transfer because I like for people to know upfront what your costs are. So you can submit the draft transfer to the Treasury Department because the evaluation has to be done on the property. It saves time. So sometimes a landowner license application for it might take sometime two months. Don't be there not knowing what's happening. You know it's 5% anyway. 5% for the landowner license. It's 2% for the stamp duty. Depends. If you're selling the land for 150,000, it doesn't mean that the 150,000 is the figure in the revenue you're going to use. They could value it for more. And if they value it for more, it's going to be that higher figure. Even if you sell the property, it's valued for less. So I'm selling the land for 150. They value it and say, look, it's 75,000. You're still paying the 150. Okay, so you have to understand these things, understand them so when you're planning, you know how to plan. There's no mystery in this thing, right? So you submit that, 
and um, they give you back the report maybe in two weeks. They're very efficient, and the evaluation takes place within a week most times. And I, I must also commend the minister because they're making significant strides at the land registry too. I can stay home and call and say, look, do a search for me and this. We pay a fee every year, $350, but I still go and check after. Or I need the paper to prove. Because if a mistake is made, I'll be sued. And that's what you have to protect against. So you got all the information you need, and you can now say to the customer or the client, this is what you're looking at, the figures you're looking at. You got the 5%, you got the 2%. You got the, the registry fees of 0 0.75 percent and legal fees. Um, if the client needs a land owning license, they'll have to submit a bio page and uh, source of funds information. All that goes into the application. And, and um, generally, it is, is approved. Um, so you walk into the Bank of Montreal and say you need a mortgage. You qualify. The bank will ask you, well, who are you going to use as your legal representative? You tell them who you want to use. They have a list of um, lawyers. And whoever is chosen, they send the instructions to the person. The person have to go back and check the land register again to see things might change from the last time you were there. You go and check again to make sure there's no encumbrances, that the bank is protected. Okay, you have to have clear title to give to the bank. And um, you give an undertaking to the bank by listing in two weeks' time, you will, um, you know, submit all the documents and disperse the funds. But we have to understand a mortgage. A mortgage is really a security for a loan. And sometimes people make the mistake thinking that um, the Limitation Act works against the bank as it works between me and you. It doesn't. Don't forget that. Because when you sign the charge document, there's a covenant between yourself and the bank. And you see references to section 67 of the Registered Land Act. You need to read that section. Because what it does, it gives the bank a right to repossess when you default. What, you cannot, what the bank cannot do is to take the matter to court after 12 years. But a bank that is wise will not bother to go to court because the charge document gives you the right to take it up. Why are you going to court for? It does, but people still go to court, wasting time. The bank has the authority to take up the property when you default. So don't think about limitation. Even 12 years gone, it doesn't matter. The document. <laughs> The charge document authorizes them to take it up. Because I hear people talking all the time, um, there's limitation, there's limitation. What limitation? It doesn't work that way because you have a covenant, a personal covenant with the bank. That, for example, if you default, they can come in. It gives 90 days. After 90 days, they can actually come in and repossess and resell the, the property. So I believe my time is closed, so it's up. Who's checking? All right. It's good? They're enjoying it? Yeah, but um, you see, sometimes I hear people speak a kind of way about um, professionals, like engineers and so on. People don't understand the responsibility. The engineer gets it wrong, you're sued. The lawyer gets it wrong, you're sued. Everybody down the chain. So we have to be always on the top of our game, not taking shortcuts, doing it right. There's only one way. Any other way is wrong. So I'll entertain questions if there are any questions on anything I spoke about or anything I couldn't let you about but I did not cover. It is an area I actually love. I, I, I wish I could just do land law for the rest of my life. And don't go to court about criminal law and all this stuff. This is really my fascination. I, I like contracts, I like thoughts, but I really like property because the things you're learning it, you know. For me to make a proper presentation on all the aspects, it takes me an hour. But I'll try to condense it down to 20 minutes. I hope you understand. I broke it down. And if anybody needs a copy, you can have a copy. All right? So you keep it. Yes. Well, it's no problem. You just arrange with the American. Yes.
Yes. Yes. All what you've heard here, you've gotten it for free. Eh? If you had to go to his office in Olveston, you'd have to pay for it. So take advantage of it. Um, two questions, Mr. Buffon. Um, the first one, sometimes a bank would send um, individuals to an attorney to get independent legal advice. Can you provide a couple scenarios where independent legal advice is required? And what is the reason for a financial institution asking customers yeah. for independent legal advice? What happens is that um, years ago in the UK, it was discovered that um, people are placing undue pressure, especially on the wives and so on, and the household, to do certain things. And the law has adopted the approach where you need to, one, make the person aware of what they're doing, and you need to have it crystallized in a document, notarized by the lawyer, saying, look, I spelled out everything to this client. She has a free choice. I told her about the pros, or sorry, the cons. Now, that helps the bank, because if the bank ignored the, 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 the right to actually ensure you get independent legal advice, the bank is not on a good footing. The bank could be sued. So the bank has to protect itself by ensuring that in such circumstances, it's not always undue influence. There are other forms of pressure where it puts somebody on alert. And that pressure, when combined, even on its own, could cause a reasonable person in a certain situation to act a kind of way. So the lie saying, we must protect this person. It's vulnerable. And that independent legal advice, so the bank will say, look, get independent legal advice. The person comes to me. I listen to everything. And I said, look, this is the situation. A, B, C. These are the plus, the minus. What do you think about it? They ask some questions. I said, blah, blah. Quite often they say, okay, right. But a lot of times the other party have not been always frank and upfront. And it creates and raises suspicion. I think if you're upfront, the person will say, okay, let's do it. But you might plan to sell a piece of land to buy a car. You and the wife own the land. Um, you're doing it behind her back. Why? Tell her, this is what we're doing. She might just agree because you're honest. But she suspects you're doing something and changes. So the bank has to really protect itself. If it doesn't protect itself, it's at risk of being sued. And it's no point a bank with a good reputation running the risk of being sued in circumstances you could be avoided. If there are any more questions, I have. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen many instances where customers come to the bank after having paid off a mortgage and asking the bank to, to just give them their land certificate. I paid you all your mortgage, I do own it. Just for the benefit of our listeners, can you just tell them very briefly um, what is the process involved in, in, in being able to return that land certificate yeah. to them? Now, a mortgager has a right of redemption. Uh, what that means is that at the point that you've paid off your mortgage, you're entitled to have the certificate which is yours now and not the bank's. But people tend to think, I just walk in the bank and say, look, I want my certificate, I paid you off, blah, blah. It doesn't work like that. So the bank had a charge or several charges on that property. And in the land registry, you'll see all the charges. Now, for you to get a certificate that you paid off, the bank has to prepare something we call a discharge of charge. So what the bank is saying basically to the land registry, we have no interest here, it's paid off, you're free to actually. And the bank will prepare the document, lawyer will notarize it, give two copies, you take to the land registry, pay a fee of $25 per charge. Sometimes people forget. Over the years, you might have had 10 charges. And so the lawyer is saying, look, there is $250 just for the charges. My fees are maybe $500. They tend to think that it, the 750 is mine. So you have to have to give them a receipt to say, look, these are your charges accumulated over the years. Each have to come out. So that's what the bank does. And sometimes the bank may get a bad name because people are acting in ignorance. But if you explain to them, I've explained to them, every time somebody comes angry, I talk to them, we could have a drink after. It's, it's really simple. You know? But if you don't know, you panic and think, well, the bank is doing this, the bank is always doing that. That's not the point. Okay, so. I hope it was useful.
and um, you could always get a copy. And I have some additional notes if you want, but um, you know, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bufong. I, I think we can give Mr. Bufong a much better round of applause. <laughs> 11 years and 10 months, that will stick in my head, Mr. Bufong. All right, um, before we go into our next presentation, I think we have some refreshments. I've just asked, it's not there yet. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, our next um, presenter, um, our next presenter would have traveled all the way from Antigua to be with us here today. No stranger to us, a monstration by birth, um, Mr. Keith Thomas, who is one of two RIC certified evaluators on the island. Mr. Thomas has over 30 years of experience and holds a Bachelor of Science degree at honors from, in civil engineering from the University of Missouri, Columbia. In 2010, Mr. Thomas was inducted as a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. In 2015, he became a FRIS fellow. FRIS is the world's leading professional body for qualifications and standards in land, property, and construction. As principal of KT Engineering Consultants Limited, KTEC Limited, he has a career practice in civil engineering related projects and a vast knowledge of tech technical consultancy experience. Some of those include civil engineering project design and procurements, leading on tender evaluation processes, technical inspections, project monitoring and report writing, geometric design of streets and highways, hydrology, hydraulics, building construction, land surveying and property valuation. He has provided these services throughout the United Kingdom and the region to include Dominica, Montserrat, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, Anguilla, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. Within the Caribbean, KTEC Limited has delivered a range of engineering services to statutory bodies, the government, and commercial and private clients. He has engaged in consultancy and direct works programs for institutions such as DFID, UNEP, DTU, um, OECS and the Caribbean Development Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in, join me in welcoming my good friend, Mr. Keith Thomas. Thank you, Baldwin. Um, happy to be here today. And um, I'm here to give the presentation about RICS, which is the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. How do you become an RICS member? First, you have to complete the assessment of professional competence. Second, a field of experience as with a RICS accredited degree, five years experience and a bachelor's degree, 10 years relevant experience operating at a high level. RICS is a worldwide um, institution in the built industry, construction, and land, which over 140,000 members with 100, in 146 countries. In the valuation business, one has to be a RICS valuer registration scheme, within the RICS valuated registration scheme. In definition, this is, it is a quality assurance program which monitors those who are, have undertaken valuation in accordance with the Red Book standards. Members who are registered and accredited in the meeting the requirements of the valuers registration scheme can then call themselves a RICS valuer, registered valuer. The Red Book is by RICS as a guide to promote high standards in valuation worldwide global standards. Valuations are done in accordance with the Red Book. There's a minimum requirement, first of all, which is VSP1, VPS1, which is 
valuation property standards. And in this, the valuer mainly is going out to inspect, investigate, and record on the property for which they are going to deal with. The third requirement, which is VPS3, is the most important, which is the reporting standards for how the valuer does his or her valuation. And there are several line items for which the valuator has to take into consideration. First, he has to identify the status of made himself the status of the valuer, identification of the client and any other intended users. In this case, it would be John Tom, and sometimes the bank is used as the client, Bank of Montreal, and the client would be John Tom. Purpose of the valuation, identifying the asset of the valuation and its liabilities valued. The basis of value, which must be adopted. Now, this is one of the most critical part of the valuation. The basis of value is a statement of fundamental measurements, assumptions of a valuation. It is also the market value or the market rent. The valuer has responsibility for ensuring that the basis of value is adopted, is consistent with the purpose of the valuation and appropriate to the circumstances. This responsibility is subject to compliance with any mandatory requirements, such as those imposed by statute. It is important that the basis is adopted, is disclosed and confirmed with the client at the outset of any case where the position is not straightforward. It is important to note that basis of value are not necessarily mutually exclusive. For example, the worth of a property or asset to a specified specific party or the equitable value of the property or asset in exchange between two specific parties may match the market value even though different assessment criteria are used. Valuers must ensure in all cases that the basis of value is produced, reproduced, or clearly identified in both the terms of the engagement, scope of works, and the report. The value must also express the evaluation date, the extent of the investigation. In these circumstances, one must look at the property, were there any hazardous, perilous materials on site, nature and source of the information. You must go to the registry by handing a land certificate to a valuer does not substantiate the property has a, a charge or caution or such things. The registry will provide an update dated on the status of the property where it, if it has a charge a caution or its freehold. Assumptions and special assumptions. One must assume Maybe the, 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 the valuation is for a loans agreement, and there's also a special assumption. That special assumption must be one which is taken on the valuer's own accord and must be expressed. Restrictions of use, distribution, and publications of the report. There must be a stated language within the evaluation in terms of slightly legal to say how this valuation must be used. And who have the right to expose this valuation, which is in most terms is the bank. Confirmation that the valuation has been undertaken in accordance with the IVS, which is International Value Standards, one valuation approach and reasoning. The amount the valuation or the valuations are in, you must also express what currency the valuation is going to be um, done in. Date of the valuation report. And you know that is different from the inspection date as well, two different dates. Commentary of any material and certainly relations to the valuation where it is essential to ensure clarity on part of the valuation user. Statement setting out limitations and liabilities that have been agreed. Value for which are obtained. Most times 
we do the market value and the market rent. And this is very um, important. I want to just make a note on this. The cost of, and Ken did mention this slightly, people who spend a lot of money building something, maybe a million dollars, but at the end of the day, it's not aesthetically pleasing. It doesn't have a value of a million dollars. You can only get it sold for 60% of what, it, what you build it for. And that's what the market value is. So going about spending a lot of money building something which is not aesthetically pleasing or not in a position to have a decent view does not mean you're getting back what you cost. So market value, when you go to sell, is the estimated amount for which an asset or liability should exchange on the valuation date between a willing buyer and a willing seller at an arm's length transaction after proper marketing and where parties had each act knowledgeable, prudently, without compulsion. So that means if you're going to sell something, both parties must be at ease. If it's not prudent or it's not compulsory, that means it wasn't under market value approach. You had forced that one to sell based on the fact that that person was in a tight position and the person just had to sell in order to get out of it. So that does not express the market value because it was not done prudently and it was done without, it was done with compulsion. Then you have the market rent, the estimated amount for which an interest in real property should be leased on a valuation date between a willing seller, leaser, and a willing leasee on appropriate lease terms in an arm's length transaction after proper marketing and where the parties had each acted knowledgeable, prudently, and without compulsion. Valuation approaches. We here, we do at least about three valuation approaches on most occasions. The first one is the market approach. The market approach is based on comparables. And this is where, like for instance, you're selling land. You're selling land in a particular area, in the Alveston area. In order for you to get a proper value for that land, it must be compared apples to apples. So in the last three years, I would like to know what properties were sold. I would check with the registry and see what properties were sold in the last three years, what were the rate, what were the views in terms of where it was located, and I would be able to have a market approach to that value of that property. So it is, and also with houses, the property itself is contained of the land and the house. So it must be distinguished that. If you're selling a property which contains a house, it is also compar comparing with other properties that were sold in a particular area, and we do a lot of what we call adjustments in order to make that property, the subject property, becomes a market value. Now, at times, you may not have enough properties sold in a particular area, so then adjustments would have to be made in order to bring those properties external of the subject property into line into alignment in order to get it compared properly. So you might sell a property in Lookout, and you may not have enough properties sold in Lookout, but you may have three in Alveston. You cannot, you can make adjustments, but when, you, when do you reach the areas of land? You may find that the properties in Islesville Plantation may be at $15 a square foot, and your property in Lookout should be at $3 a square foot. You would then have to bring those in line by adjustments in order to compare these two differential locations. We also do the income approach. The income approach is basically to deal with, it's based on capitalization or conversation of present and conversion of present and predicted income cash flow, which may take a number of different forms to produce a single current capital value. 
among the forms taken, capitalization of a conventional market-based income or discounting of a specific income projection can both be considered appropriate depending on the type of asset where such approach would be adopted by the market. Now in this sense, we use the, cap the income approach in areas like commercial spaces, um, hotels where you have rental rooms, and it's the income generated over an annual period, also using a capitalization rate, separating your costs in terms of um, specific overruns during that period in order to get to a value. So it is specific that during the income approach also, there is an alternative, which is the discount cash flow method. And as I had explained recently to fellow colleagues in valuation, you cannot use comparables in the income approach. Reason why it is also used for the cash the discount cash flow method, no, sorry, not comparables. You cannot use weighted averages to assume the income approach. But in the discount cash flow method, within the income approach, you can use the weighted average. It's very, um, not confusing, but it has to be specific. Whereby, in the market approach, you cannot explicitly use the weighted averages. It must be just the averages because you are already doing adjustments within your line items to come at a final value. Okay, so and many times, valuers would have gone on to use weighted averages during the computation of the market approach and that was not permitted by RICS unless you're using the subgroup of discount cash flow method within the income approach. That's the only area for which you could use um, the weighted averages. We go into resident, um, residual methods. It's not a method for which I am an expert on, but I would give just a definition for it. And the residual method is so-called because it indicates the residual amount after deducting all known or anticipated cost requirements to complete the development from an anticipated value of a project when completed after consideration of the risks associated with the completed completion of the report. This is known as the residual method. The residual, the, the residual value can be highly sensitive to relatively small changes in the forecast cash flow and the practitioner should provide separate sensitivity analysis for each significant factor. And one of the key notes for the residual method is that the higher the yield, the greater the risk. One has to be careful in terms of using this method and very incremental movements could cause you to get it wrong. The profit method, I would not go into this one, this is more of investments and um, people that are dealing with um, that area of economics. The cost approach is the approach for which is, should be least used in determining the value of a property. But the cost approach is based on the economic principle a purchaser will pay no more for an asset than it costs to obtain one of equal utility, whether by purchase or construction. Now, the cost approach is important for the insurance factor because the insurer wants to make sure that he's paying no more than what this building needs to be replaced. Now, other school of thought would also add demolition and removal. Some insurance don't want to pay that neither because that's base, that's you. The insurance is not interested in the demolition and removal, but there are some banks who insist that the client 
is going to bear that cost because the insurance company is going to take out the deductibles and the, current, the client is going to still left with a search of pocket. So we use the cost approach in order to finalize what is the value, no, the value of the building at the present time. And it's based on discounting that item, line item within the building. If it was a 15-year-old building, we would say this in most occasions, it takes 60 years life for this particular property. And um, we discount it 1.7% annually throughout its lifetime. And we do come up with a current value of what it would cost at this point. But that's not value. Value is going to be somewhere like 30%, 20% less than what it costs at that point in time. Finally, I'm going to the end. What is RICS motto? It says, this is, this is very strict, strict um, principles for which I have based my life on. And after doing, having been to the court in 2000 in the UK, commercial courts, it was very important to me to know how my future was going to be going forward. We, I was asked to come to the UK in 2000 to defend the valuation report for which I did on ISB Plantation. The company, Lawrence Green, said, well, the High Court judge said, whoever did this report, if he's not in England, this case is thrown out. So I got the opportunity at the age of 33 to do, go there. And this shaped my career. And so for every valuation I present, I present it as if it would end up in the court. Hence, one must act with integrity, always provide a high standard of service, act in a way that promotes trust and in the profession, treat others with respect, take responsibility. I also acknowledge the presence of one of my assistants, Mr. Dean Truitt, who um, we worked together in Antigua, and um, he's a QS, and he's now with me um, training in valuation, and um, very good steward of the, the profession. I do see also my colleague, Mr. Adrian Galloway, whom um, at several, a few times I've been his counselor, and um, that is because, well, in um, the RICS business, we counsel um, others in order for them to elevate to a different level from where they are. In Antigua, I'm also a um, counselor and mentor for several professionals who have unfortunately were not, um, are not certified and hence could not do any further work for the bank until they're certified. So I reached out. Um, most of them never met me today, but we have, have communicated with them and allowed them through the RICS portal and um, review all their casework so that they could be accredited. And thus far, I have been working for the Bank of Montserrat, Antigua Union Bank, Antigua Commercial Bank, CIBC First Caribbean, and for the last so many years, been working with CDB on several infrastructure projects. So um, that is my final, and um, any questions? I do acknowledge my mother. A lot of people don't know who my mother is, but yeah, that's my mother in the background. I think you made me when you were 19 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any questions? And this is my teacher, my teacher also put in a question to me. <laughs> did you win the, um, did, um, the case? What was the outcome of that case in the UK? Yeah, the case was Martini in investment versus Neil McGinnins. And the other side was a McLaren topless out of Bahamas. And very strangely about this case, and I go back to what Ken said again, um, we won the case. And the main, my main approach to the valuation was aesthetics. The properties at Isbe Plantation were damaged by the volcano in some form. And in areas such as the roof, there were some shingles, 
was wallable, not wallable, it's compressed cardboard, it's not really um, wood shingles, but it's man-made. Some were blown off from some, some areas, you had hardways that were spoiled by the volcanic damages and stuff like that, paints needed to be done here and there. The other side gave the claim based on just what was damaged. I'm just paying for that side of the wall that was paint. I'm just paying for this area of the roof. Well, I approach evaluation from a point of purely aesthetics, not even structural aesthetics, whereby it's a high-end area, villas uh, over $2 million, and I'm saying that aesthetically pleasing, the client cannot sell his property, his or her property, because matching colors, true aging in any way, it's already been devalued. And that approach came from when I worked at Four Seasons in Nevis in my early years, which I took a big decision back then to a lot of people was kind of crazy. I asked Miss Annie Dyer how back in 1986, I'd like to quit my job. i like a year off without pay. She said, well, who, who takes a year off without pay? I said, I'd like to just get a year off without pay because I needed experience. So I went to Four Seasons and I worked with a gentleman, Alan LaFrance, who worked at Nantucket for the Camelots in Boston. And I learned a lot of um, quality stuff that give value and not cost. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one, Mr. Thomas. Um, I know many people get valuations done on the properties. And the first thing they do when they get the valuation is, is flip through and go to the page before the last and see, well, what's the value of my property w or the property that I plan on buying? What is the danger of paying sole attention to just the value of the property and not the rest of the document? Well, yes, I found out that too is not only just the client, but even insurance companies. They want to see it on the first page. So what I've done recently is to put a summary on the first page that you see everything before you go to the bank. Because everybody just wants to see what's the cost of what's going on there. The danger also of not reading the full evaluation, especially one like mine, which is a bit lengthy, is that I am trying to cover as much as I see as express in the red book, in the red book, knowing that the values registration scheme is one for which you are assessed. You are asked to submit your valuations by RICS. They just pick whatever year, and you have to submit these, and they want to see, well, if you're in compliance with the whole procedure, okay? But of recent, my valuation report has a summary page at the front that even the, the, those at the bank, they don't want to read the whole thing. They just want to just see what, what's the insurance, what's the value, what's the that, you know, what's the cost approach what it would take for this, and just up front get a decision. But it's important to read the entire report. Because we, we, we make mistakes, definitely. We make mistakes. There's so much valuations being done, like in May. I think I did 31 valuations uh, myself and Dion and our colleague in Antigua, which was about 20-something million dollars one time. And the reason why we had to do so much valuation one time because ECCB regulations came in and hit the banks. Hit, not hit the banks because the banks knew that this was coming in. But every um, professional practitioner was just sitting on it. They didn't know that ECCB was going to come so serious. So when ECCB closed the dates, then the banks couldn't get anyone to do any more valuation. So we had to take on the brunt of dealing with just CIBC, boatload, ACB at the same time, Caribbean Union Bank, name it. We had a bank monster, you know, a boatload going at the same. We were kind of like crashed out and stressed. But fortunately, Dion and Marisa, plus my team here, which is, I'm not, I'm going to mention them, not, I'm not seeing them here today, but you have Jovita White who does nail tech, and you had Denise Greenaway. They work sidelines to just help me complete a lot of this stuff. So I'm, a, I'm really fortunate to have some good, um, a young team with me expressively. 
Keith. I have one, one, one follow-up question. Oh, and my, uh, my architect, he doesn't do valuation with us, but he works, he works on, us, on, on our Dominica water projects, which we are doing right now. That's Carl and Brad. Right. <laughs> um, my follow-up question, I, I, Mr. Buffon made a, a critical point in his presentation regarding somebody acquiring a piece of land that was landlocked. Um, in doing your valuations, if you notice that a property is landlocked, would you highlight it in the valuation? Yes, we have, we have dealt with one just recently, very valuable property in terms of its location, but unfortunately, a landlocked property only, you can only argue, if you can, zero to 25% of what the value, and furthermore to that, a landlocked property really doesn't have any value. It is all dependent on the, the, bound, the people who are bounded by that property. If they are willing to give you access or not, it all depends upon them. You have must highlight when a property is landlocked. We just um, identified one in, for Antigua Commercial Bank in a very exclusive area, Half Moon Bay. Four acres of land. The surrounding properties are like $46 per square foot going up. But unfortunately, the property for which the subject property is only suggested it could get about $6 a square foot because it's landlocked. A landlocked property in legal terms does not have any legal access. And hence, you're in the, um, the, you are the, the mercies of, of the bounded owners. If they decide to, and most times they don't because the landlocked property is something that they want to extend their property and they're not going to give you no more. That's easy on, on based on the market value. On the alternative side of a landlocked property, a landlocked property also could have a good value. Express, example, you have the port which is being built right now. Properties bounding with the port, and where the port may need to extend, that property becomes valuable. Because you, the, you the, the, the client, this needs that subject property and may be willing to pay a good amount for it. Yes, you have properties like that, where they're bounded with the sea or something, and you want to make your backyard or um, a supermarket, you want a par um, parking area, you need that property. So that property becomes valuable. But in most cases, not in, in, in any case, a landlocked property does not have any legal access. And that's the definition. And Mr. Buffon could explain that further. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. The, the, the point I was trying to make when I asked a question about going through the valuation was to read through to ensure there are no, no challenges of that nature um, that may create problems for the potential buyer down the road. So thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause again, please. I think the morning has been good so far, right? Good. Um, our next presenter is, oh, yeah. Um, I'm just informed that the snacks are there. I don't want to create too much disruption during the presentation, so if I can ask one or two of my team members, if we can take it and bring it for the people, so we don't have too many people getting up and, and, and walking in and out. I think that might be a more orderly um, and less dis disruptive manner. Yeah, thank you. Um, our next presenter is Mr. Um, Barry Chalmers, Barrington Chalmers. I, I know more for, more, most of us know him as, as Barry. Um, Barry is a monstration businessman, contractor from Breeds, and who was one of the first men to begin building his family business of BBC Radio and TV in Breeds over 25 years ago. In addition to building in Breeds, the new de facto capital of Montserrat was the vol um, after the volcanic eruptions, Barry has built and designed many homes and commercial buildings across the island. Barry enjoys music, playing the piano, and fellowship with his church family. Um, I have to add that, you know, when I first came here, um, I, I met Barry. I didn't know of his talent, and, and he came to me um, with the proposal for the, the, the BBC building. 
Um, and um, I, I wonder, uh, is this man really serious? You know, he's quite talented. Um, and, and now that the building is finished, um, we have to agree that it is one of the nicer, nicer buildings. I think last year we had two, two fairly nice buildings going up, one across the road from us, um, the FSC building, and the second one was Barry's own. Barry has completed, is pretty much completed his, and I think it has turned out to be a wonderful um, pro project. So I, I thought no better person to bring to talk to us today about construction, and I think he designed and built it on his own. So Barry, welcome. Good morning. I want to acknowledge and give respect to my fellow presenters, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Bufang, Mr. Castle, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. I'm very happy to be here this morning and also to see so many young people who want to build houses to buy into the Monsat dream. I, I would, would like to keep my remarks on a casual level, speaking to prospective people who are interested in investing in our country. As a teenager, the dream of building my own home is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. A topic that has been one of my passions for the majority of my life. Realizing the dream of owning my own home. As a teenager growing up, while some of my friends would dream about other things, cars, having money, girlfriends, different things. I would dream of someday, in the not too distant future, of owning and building my own home. I would soak up many of those house planning magazines, architectural digests. I would remember drawing out my floor plans on graph paper, several revisions. I would go, I was able to buy my first property at the age of 19, and before I would know all of the technical um, considerations like land slope and drainage and all of those things, I would remember going there in the afternoon, sitting down, in visual, visualizing the views, the orientations, I would like to take advantage of the breezes, just dreaming about my future and about this great investment that I knew I wanted to undertake. I would choose to build my house in an incremental fashion. I know I didn't, I didn't have the funds to build everything one time. So I went about it a practical way and I started small. I started with what I could afford. I, I was very impressed with looking at plans that were under 1,000 square feet that were doable for me. It, doesn't make any, it didn't make any sense for me to go and build a big mansion and can't get anywhere with it. I decided to build something that I could manage personally. I, I realize that the cost of home ownership has increased significantly over the years. I know the prospect, the dream of home ownership today is a daunting one. Many have resigned themselves to renting or leasing a home as a solution to their housing needs. Today I want to make the case that one of the presenters spoke about a former politician. I want to, to, to 
focus on that. That yes, every monstration can own their own home. It is a doable dream. During the following eight points, I want to propose a strong case for home ownership of your own home early in life. Not only any old home, but for me, practically, a concrete home. A durable, concrete structure that can serve the needs of your family, of your individual functions and tastes. My first point for me would be stability. Stability. I want to ask the young people here today, if I could just have a little interaction. How many of you are currently renting a house? Yes. Are you satisfied in that position? Yes. I know. For me, paying a mortgage will always be better than paying rent. A mortgage has an end date. Rent, there is no ending. There can be no ending. A mortgage is fixed and will, in all likelihood, never change for the duration of the loan. Rent is greatly subject to inflation over time. From my own experiences, I can tell you that 20 years ago, when we moved to Braids, you could get a, a reasonable two-bedroom house for four, five hundred dollars a month. Now, you, you, you're looking at over a thousand dollars. That is double what it was over the course of a loan. And there is no guarantee that your, the rate of your rent will stay the same. Whereas your premium for your mortgage is fixed until the end of the loan. Over the span of 20 years in this country, I have seen the cost of rent double and sometimes triple. The first benefit of house ownership is that when you become your own landlord, you have the peace of mind that your housing outlay will remain consistent until the end of the loan. And that, for me, is a great form. That makes it all worth it. That is one of the things that makes it all worth it for me. The second point I would like to go into benefit of home ownership for me is equity. Equity. Now, how many of you could, could tell me, is there anyone here who, who could give me an idea of what equity means for them? I know it's a big word, it's a very important word. Any of the younger people? For me, I'm, I'm looking at Mrs. Aspin. She told me, she taught me actually in accounting, in, in maths and, and accounting and different subjects, that old accounting equation, that assets is equal to liability plus equity on a basic level. And it's very simply is, if you own this home for 100,000 and you borrow 90,000 on it and you bring to the table, let's say $10,000 as a deposit, it would simply mean that your liability would be 90,000 and your equity would be 10,000. But with each and every monthly payment, your equity would increase and your liability would decrease. 
So the, the, the actual equity would go back to your favor. Think about it. If you rented a house today for $1,000 a month, and you, you were paying $12,000 a year in rent, and over the course of an average loan of 20 years, you would have spent $240,000. And at the end of that time, you would have had the grand sum total of equity in that house that you've lived in for 20 years of zero dollars. Think about that. Let, that. let that sink into you. After spending so much, so much time in rent, you would have literally no part of that house. Whereas if you were paying a mortgage, you could have been significantly on your way to complete ownership. The next benefit for me, personally, of owning your own home is appreciation. When I first came out north from Plymouth 20 years ago, you could build a home for roughly, there, there are many other factors, but you could build a home for roughly $150 a square foot. I have seen that cost double to over $300 a square foot for that same home. And in some cases, it has even increased more than that. It simply means that if you built a, a home, if you built a 1,000 square foot home back in the early 2000s, and you could have built it for $150,000. Today, it could very easily cost you over 300,000 to build the same house. That's almost a 100% increase in cost. For me, that is a very decent return and an investment. Wealth. The fourth point I want to make is that after taking into consideration the effects of amortizing, amortization of your loan and the building of personal equity value and the natural appreciation of real estate, I've come to the conclusion that home ownership is one of the best ways to build wealth in Monswat. I, with, due, with all due respect to the manager of Bank of Monswat, they have their program, Wealth Builders, saving money and different things. I, I, I would give way to that idea, but for me, personally, owning your home, paying it off over a set period of time, watching it appreciate in value is one of the surest ways that you can build wealth for, 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 for a common man. Imagine if you, if you were to buy your property in your 1920 and you were to embark on building your home. By the time you hit 40, instead of being still in rent, you can walk away. You have a home for $300,000 in equity, free and clear of liability. Can you imagine the confidence, the satisfaction that feeling can give you? The fifth point I want to say that home ownership brings for me is freedom. The old saying goes, 
A man's house is his castle. When you own your own home, you are free to make any modification, any optimization, any improvement that you want to make without asking permission from a landlord. The sixth benefit for me is revenue generation. This has been a very important part for me of owning property, being able to rent and realize some income from rental properties. It has been very rewarding for me to be able to rent properties to, to a variety of people. It, in fact, it has actually been, been um, becoming a very good source of income for me. And I would encourage all young people to seriously consider that in their planning process of designing their home. The seventh point for me that I have taken advantage of with home ownership is tax relief. I've been able to claim back my, the interest parts of my um, tax payments to the bank for mortgage. I have also over the years in business made, been able to make provision for depreciation modestly. I heard Mr. Thomas said 60 years working time frame for the life of a building. But it, it all adds up and it can also give you significant relief with taxes. And the eighth and final point for me of owning a home is accomplishment. Accomplishment and satisfaction. I was able to clear my first home a few years ago. And for me, it was, it was very satisfying to, to know that you don't have to rent any place. This is mine, free and clear of liability. And I'm, I'm looking at all of the young people here today. And if there's anything that comes out of this symposium, I'm hoping that that would be one of the accomplishments that each of you would achieve. I know that it, at times it can seem very challenging. You know, I, I listen to, to all of the different present, presenters and I know that they're going to make sure that everything is covered. But overall, it can be very rewarding. Choosing a contractor. I know that in Monsuat, in the Monsuat context, many will choose a contractor based on family connections, personal trust, and the perception that that contractor will have their best interests at heart, and so on. For me, I would say that experience, 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 followed by, closely by reputation, reputation, very important. I, I heard uh, Ms. Amanda said that, that the capacity to build. But for me, contractors being able to have the right equipment, a truck, mixers, um, equipment, boxing, different things, will greatly enable the contractor a wider range to provide a wider range of services and be more competitive. There are three points I want to, to point out that are very important for me as a contractor. I don't really do a lot of contract work presently, 
as I'm trying to focus on my family business. But for me, speaking to you, young people, in, in discussing going about engaging a contractor, the first point would be to se setting a budget and a timeline, and a practical budget and a timeline. I have found it very helpful for the contractor and the homeowner to take the time to sit down together, set it out in writing, a multiple staged budget. I saw them have four stages there. But for me, it's, it's almost better if you, if you break it down into even further stages. And at each of these stages run consecutively so that both parties can have a, a, a good chance to assess and to make sure that they're happy with each other. A budget can help to avoid a lot of grievances and a lot of problems in the future. This stage budget will include a commitment of what the contractor will provide for the homeowner at each stage. And simultaneously, it will provide a commitment from the home homeowner what the contractor can expect to receive financially. These stages should run consecutively so as to give both the contractor and the homeowner an assessment of each other early on. I, I can't emphasize this part enough because I know that it goes both ways. There are many contractors who have had a bad name because of unfulfilled bad communication and there are, there are many homeowners who contractors to this day, if the two of them are walking, one walk on one side of the road and the other one walks on the other side of the road. And we don't want to, we don't want to have that happen. So very early on, put it on, on, on in paper. Agree between yourselves. When you finish this, this is what I expect and this is what you can expect. The second thing is, after agreeing to a budget, stick to it. Stick to it. I, I, am, I am guilty, I have been guilty of that. You draw a plan, you have 10 feet for a bedroom, all of a sudden you feel that you want to go 12 feet. You want to run up variance, variations, you want to do different things, and you feel that you can do it. The contractor has his reservations, but you push the contractor to, to put in the extra two feet, and he, get, he, 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 he said, okay, but nobody wants to put up the extra funds. Nobody wants to take the, the consequences of these changes. And sometimes they, they feel the contractor should take, the, should take the, 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 the fall. And or sometimes the homeowner. It, it can go very bad when you don't stick to the budget and you don't stick to the plan. Deviations cause arguments. They cause disagreement. You cannot expect to add a whole room or rooms to a house that were not accounted for in the budget or plan and expect everything to go smoothly. You cannot say I have some extra funds now so I can dip in or buy a car or go take my family and travel to Miami and go shopping and expect that everything will go smoothly. There are consequences for bad decisions. And all too often, it ends up very badly. And God forbid in court. I leave that part to Mr. Buffon. 
I have seen sometimes in the initial budget, a family and the contractor would sit down and they would say, okay, based on Monsfort's vendors, we're going to buy four, five dollar floor tiles. And all of a sudden, they see the money and they say, okay, I'm going to buy ten dollar marble tiles, US dollars, marble tiles, that they're going to bring in from, from Miami. They forget about the freight, the duties, all of the other incidental costs. And the budget is smashed. And where is the money coming from? Stick to the budget. Stick to the plan. Keep it simple. Communication. Thirdly, Communication. Communication is key in having a successful project. I agree communication with the architect is very important, but for me personally, communication between you and your contractor is paramount. The, the program said choosing a contractor. But the reality is the contractor homeowner relationship is a two-way relationship. The contractor's duty is to provide and realize the needs of the homeowner in the completion of a comfortable, functional home. Likewise, the homeowner is providing a job and source of living for the contractor. Both parties effectively communicating their goals to each other at all stages is the key to a successful project. In conclusion, building a house or in some cases, buying an existing house is a monumental task. It will require ambition, vision, a lot of discipline, financial discipline, perseverance, and faith. I want to declare here today that yes, it can be done successfully, and the rewards far outweigh the challenges. Now, I know, I know that in speaking to a lot of people in Montserrat, sometimes there may be a confidence issue. I, I'm glad to see so many young people here today to consider this. I know a lot of people are saying, why should I invest in Monsrat? Why should I choose Monsrat to build my home? I know a lot of people are going away. One, one lady in an interview told me, asked me, what do you see in Monsrat, Barry? Why you would build such a building in Monsrat? Why would you invest? so much in this country. And I, I would say to, to, to you, those of you who, who are seriously contemplating of buying into the dream of home ownership in this country, that when I look at this country, I see a country that we haven't had a murder in several years that I can, I can rec recollect. I see a peaceful country. I see a, a place that understand that there are many people today who would do anything to live in a country like this. They would prefer to go. Yes. They would prefer to go and take their chances in the volcano, in the exclusion zone, and escape daily. I won't even say crime, but murder, murder rates, robbery, oppression. 
I've, I've looked at our area of Montserrat in the Caribbean. I've looked at many of our surrounding British overseas territory citizen. I'm gonna use the British overseas territory citizen because we share a lot in common, legally. You, you look at the um, Cayman Islands, BVI, um, Turks and Caicos, Anguilla. I've been able to travel to a few of them and have seen how they've developed, how they've used their, their, their creativity to develop many of their sectors, tourism, the financial sectors, agricultural sectors. There's so many things that we can do to develop our country and make a living, a very decent living in this country. And I cannot accept that for me personally, that it would be better for me to go to England and live there and leave all of this behind. There is too much here that we can do to say that that is the only option for me. So with that, I, want, I just want to encourage all of the young people here. I heard the bank manager said that they were looking for young people he said that to me, to take mortgages, build homes, invest in this country. And I, I also want to end with one last point in that I know when sometimes when I hear the advertisement on Radio Monsat, come in and get your loan. And they make it sound so flashy and so... Um, I said, I wish it was the same person that was on Radio Monsat was the one that was approving these loans. And, you know, I know that in everything, there is an element of risk. In everything, there is an element of risk for the bank. There's an element of risk for you. But I can say to you that where there is little risk, there is little gain. Where there is great risk, there is great gain. If you do not take any risks in this life, you cannot gain anything. So I encourage you to take the risk if you're so predisposed and embark on your journey of owning your own home. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, do we have any questions for Barry? You, you know, Barry's, Barry's presentation for me was a touching one because it came from the heart. Yeah. And I think Barry has given you the best advice that you can get as young people thinking of owning a home. If, if, if he had his presentation, I would tell him make a copy for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Barry. I okay. see we have a question at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, everyone. Uh, so my question is just that: um, What's a realistic uh, cost per square footage to build in this day and age, and what exactly does that get you? What, what? Could you repeat that, please? What's a realistic cost per square footage in this day and age to build, and what exactly does that get you? Like, what do you get for that price? Okay. Um, there, there are many factors in, in the price per square foot, and that would have to come down to you and your architect. Or, but in a ballpark figure today is over $300 a square foot. Now, there are, there, are many, there are many things for me as young people that you can choose to do. I know the, the manager was discussing with me other options of, um, 
or the types of construction. But for me, especially for that first home, if I was starting out, I would want to go with a good concrete um, house with a durable roof, like concrete roof or, or wooden roof, if you so desire. But I wouldn't cut any corners around that because for me, this is something that you're going to be building on for the rest of your, for, for, well, not, not necessarily for the rest of your life because in my personal life, I was able to build my first house and then leverage it and move on to build other properties that I use for rent. So my first house, I would go with a fully concrete house at $300 a square foot plus. The second thing about it is that I found from experience, building a wooden house, they, they tend to depreciate much faster and the, the maintenance upkeep on them is, is far greater than a concrete house. I mean, they're not as ex aesthetically pleasing as a nice wooden frame house with a lot of hips and valleys and, and different things, but in terms of durable, durability and value, they are, and maintenance levels being very low, I would, I would definitely say concrete would be the best way to go for the first house. Um, good day. Um, good day. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'd just like to ask, what was the brainchild behind the, um, the building that you have there? Yes. What, what, was the, what gave you the inspiration for that type of building and, uh, and the location? Well, before, before we built that building, we were involved in renting a lot of commercial spaces to various businesses. And um, in my travels, I, I was always very impressed with how other businesses in different countries in the Caribbean um, built their, their businesses. I, I really wanted to eventually go with a mall type complex, but because of the, the geography in Montserrat and the way how our land situation is set up, I, I couldn't get to realize that, that dream. So what, what we did with that building is that we were able to, to to part out about 15 to 17 small businesses, offices, a good range of, of services, and rent them out at affordable prices because we wanted to have, we wanted to be able to provide economical spaces to businesses in, in terms of encouraging long-term use and um, the, that they are more resilient than what we had before. What we had before was wooden and in terms of hurricane ability to withstand natural disasters. So we wanted to just basically upgrade the, 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 the standards of commercial spaces in Brits. And the second thing is that I, I wanted to do. I, I know that the government over the years has said that they wanted Brits, I mean, Little Bay to be the, um, the capital. But I have seen gradually a concentration of, of business activity within Braids. And I really wanted to, to capitalize on that. When, when I saw Monlek move to Braids, I was very happy. I saw both, all three banks, Bank of Montserrat, Credit Union, and to some extent, Building Society moved to Braids, government headquarters, a good, a good range of supermarkets and different things. I, I, I wanted to first, I first, see, first saw a concentration in Braids, and I, I really thought it would have been prudent to try and capitalize on that. Not, not, not fighting the flow, just going with it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. 
My question is, I, I love spectacular views. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, Monstrat is prime for that. You know, the yeah. breeze, the and so on. Yeah. So in terms of building, um, is there a significant difference um, in terms of building on the flat as opposed to capturing the views and in terms of value of your property? What would you recommend? Because, I mean, to me, the beauty is being able to view, yeah. to see, feel the breeze, and, and that kind of thing. What would you recommend? Well, my, from my experience, I, I heard Mr. Castle say about that to gentle slope. But I do like a gentle sloping property. For the simple reason is, is that if I were to build a house as a first house, I would, I would build the um, cut, cut, build, put the property in two steps and have a basement with my house being on top. A basement, a rentable basement to help me supplement my rental, my, my income. And, um, and with the, the second floor, hopefully you can overlook a sea view or some landscape. It adds a lot of value to the house, to the property. You, you, you can imagine, especially in planning the house, you have the living room framing a nice view of the sea, and that's very popular in Montserrat. <coughs> With the breakfast, you can have your breakfast, your tea, on your porch, you know, real Caribbean style. Yes. The sunset would be actually a perfect one. I mean, you have a nice porch. I like to frame my porches right off the living room and the kitchen, so that I can, you can double, I can eat my dinner. You can eat your dinner with your family, you can even make it romantic with your partner, yes. I'm trying to give you ideas, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I just want to respond to two, yeah. both Ken and Barry, about and this situation they're speaking of. I hear they're promoting yeah. Bill and Nice, concrete building. Yeah. I'm going against that. Yeah. I'm saying that we need to go back to the technology of the 28, 1928, 1920s, when the architects were designing the roofs that you see the churches survive That's true. That's I've true. been the UN technologist expert for Barbuda and Antigua, 2019. And one of the things I've experienced that in Barbuda, in Hamilton, Codrington, yeah. one of the only houses that survived yeah. was a roof that had a pitch of a 912, yeah. short eave, and he survived all the concrete houses around. In Dominica, it was the same. Yeah. One of the great technologies in Montreal is the churches. Yes. And I've always looked at St. Peter's, where I modeled my second house off which is the Anglican Church in St. Peter's and the clinic. And there's one piece of technology that we have missed as architects and engineers today, which is Just. the hole in the top of the roof at the eave. It is to reduce the, 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 the differential pressures mm. on the outside, imploding the roof and lifting it off, causing a vacuum. And what that whole hole does it equals the balance of pressure outside and inside and keeps the, 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 the roof on. Yeah. The roof doesn't really blows off. It's yeah. just a differential pressure that lifts the roofs off. And the old people would always tell you, when the wind go left the whole window them open, mm -hmm. let the wind come through. That's true. It, it was yes. because to balance the pressure. It yeah. looks to me very ugly just seeing concrete roofs all the time. Yeah. What, people, what we need to do is to understand the technology that was going on in the early 1900s how they did it. Yes, we're not going back to wood, wood pins to allow the roof yeah. to, to move in, was, in, in, in small increments. But it's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful Caribbean, if you go to Curacao and all these Aruban stuff like that, and even in Dominica, the towns, and so in St. Lucia, it's beautiful to see yeah. our nice 9, 12, steep pitch roofs, short mm. eaves, nice painted, and just outlasting yeah. Yeah. all the other structures which are there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not one of those that are going to promote 
just a <laughs> rigid concrete structure. Yeah. What we have done for the UN in terms of the technology needs export to for climate change adaptation and meeting basically adaptation, you have and even our design that we are doing in Dominica right now in terms of pipeline, you have to allow the structure that you do to serve with the environment. You must allow it to move. Yeah. In, in, if you go to New York, yes, you see the buildings through at the top. You must allow your design not to force with the, not to counter the forces of the, of the environment, but to go with it. Yeah. So we have pipelines in our design which flows with the rivers on cables and it allows it to sway. You have to be complement with it. And this is what these roofs does as well. Yeah. They allow to, to work in harmony with the environment. Any too much resistance allows it to snap. Yes. But I, I would say that I, I too, am also a great admirer of our traditional architecture. I've, I've been able to study a lot of them. And uh, my grandfather was also a carpenter along those lines. And I, I used to love to in his house, I would go to his house. I remember going to his house and watching how he would pin the rafters to a, a, um, his cross piece and his color ties. And I know that it, it has been a loss, almost a lost trade among our contractors today. We've, we've gone to a more rigid concrete design. But yes, I would agree with you that uh, where possible, it's, it's a good way to go. I think we have a question from Linda. Hi, thanks. Um, I just actually wanted to endorse what Keith would have mentioned in terms of the, the home design and the materiality. Um, a lot of times we tend to gravitate here in Munster to concrete buildings, concrete roofs. And I understand because it makes us feel a lot more secure, especially when it comes to hurricanes. But most times when you have a concrete building, it's a lot more rigid and it tends actually not to do as well when it comes to seismic forces. So you can either have, as Keith said, you can have a building that actually moves or isn't as rigid, so it moves with whatever seismic forces are out there, any wind, wind loads or so, or you can have an extremely rigid structure. Now, that being said, when you have a concrete building that's both walls and roof, concrete tends to retain heat during the day and it lets it off during the night. That's why many times when you have a building that has a concrete roof during the night, it actually feels a lot hotter, right? Now, you can either have ceilings that actually have that insulated type of, of um, threshold, or as Keith said, you can have a timber roof and as you know, heat rises and it actually dissipates out the timber. So it's just something to also consider as well. We don't also we don't always have to gravitate towards the concrete roofs. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, if we have nothing else for Barry, um, Barry, thank you very much. Yeah. I think Barry is a much bigger round of applause. I remember growing up as a child, and just to add a little to the last piece of the conversation that we had, um, growing up as a child, I grew up in a, one of those old-time wooden houses. Keith called it a wooden pin. I knew them as wooden pegs. Um, most of the house had, had those wooden pegs that they use, and it had a very steep, steep roof. And I remember going through Hurricane David at the time that, that wreaked havoc on the, the lower Caribbean. Um, and somewhere about five or six o'clock in the afternoon, my father closed his wooden shutters like what we have on the building here, and he put a piece of wood across it and closed up the house. And, and throughout the night, Hurricane was, was doing what it had to do outside. And at about six o'clock in the morning when the winds had calmed down, my father opened up the windows and I looked out and all the trees had fallen and I noticed galvanized roofs from other houses all over the place. And I'm wondering what's left on top of ours. And I went out and I looked up 
and there wasn't a sheet of galvanized that had flown off the roof. So just to add to what Keith is saying, I think there's value in it. I appreciated the last discussion. It's about personal choice. Those who may want a timber roof, those who may want a wooden structure, those who may want a concrete roof, um, it's about deciding what we want for ourselves. And um, once we're happy with it, investigate it, do, do your research, see what will work best for you, and make the decision that you will be comfortable with. Because in the end, you're the one who will be paying the mortgage. You're the one who will have to drive up your driveway every day, being satisfied or dissatisfied with the decision that you have made. So take your time and do the research. Um, Barry also made a, a couple points, you know, relating to, to choosing your contractor. Experience, experience, experience. And, and that is very critical. You want to make sure that you choose somebody who can deliver what you, what you want. Too often we tend to go with the, the contractor who offers the lowest price. The lowest price is not, not necessarily the, 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 the most experienced. And you may, may end up running with the contractor who gives you the lowest price and end up in problems that will cost you a lot more than, than some of the other contractors. So let us keep that in mind when we choose in our contractor. The other point that Barry made is, is sticking to the plan, and, and that is most critical. Um, understand your plan, as Amanda said, um, and when you have that plan, make sure you stick to it. Barry made reference to extending a room by, by two feet. If you have a 10-foot room, and, and you extend it by, by, by two feet, and sometimes you have a two-story building, that two-foot two, um, two extension by, by 10 feet has to go all the way to the, the second floor. Now, I'm no architect, no quantity severe, but it has to cost money because you have more blocks, you have more cement, you have more steel, you have more everything. And, and you, you know, in our discussions with the contractors, we say, well, you know, I want to extend it. The first thing the contractor will tell you, yeah, no problem, not a problem, we can do it. But there's a cost to it. And at the end of the day, you will never win the contractor if you have given the contractor instructions to extend it by two feet, okay, and, and not anticipate that there will be some cost associated with the extension that you have requested. So be very careful. I strongly recommend that you not alter those plans unless it is absolutely necessary because there's a cost to every single change that you make to the plan. So Barry, thank you very much for that. Um, you, you made your last point. Everyone can own a home. It is something that I believe in. I think everybody should be able to own a home. And that is why we are here today, so that Bank of Montserrat can partner with you to make sure that you are all able to own your home. Thank you, Barry. Our next presentation to, we had Amanda opening the button, a lady open the button. We'll have a lady closing the baton. Our next presenter is from the Department of, of Energy, and she will be talking to us on the best practices for incorporating green energy into our homes. Ms. Marissa Allen currently serves as the Director of Energy within the Ministry of Communication, Works, Labor, and Energy. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, and a Master's of Science in Geoenergy from the University of Edinburgh. She works with the energy department staff and other organizations to develop and implement renewable energy um, projects across Montserrat with the aim of improving the standard of living in, on the island. Marissa, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're gonna take a look at what the final steps are if you've either built or bought your home, how to make it more green and sustainable. So the first thing I want to say is um, Chief Seattle stated that we do not inherit the earth from our parents, but we borrow it from our children. So we want to ensure that whatever decisions we make and implement, that they ensure a green and sustainable future for the future. Um, people of Montserrat and generally the population. So what we're going to look at today is the average um, household energy usage, energy management, and the stages to improve energy efficiency in your homes. So as time has progressed, um, more appliances in the homes has become a norm. And with this, this um, results in a higher electricity consumption. 
So these appliances can range from refrigeration, refrigerators, washing machines, and TVs. Um, and thus, as you can see, the energy consumption can increase by 30, 13, or 11 percent, respectively. So in temperate climates, you would experience larger temperature changes, and thus, there are larger portions of their energy that is consumed by um, space heating or water heating. However, in Montserrat, as our climate is pretty consistent, a lot of our energy consumption patterns actually differ. So this is an example from four Caribbean countries, um, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Lucia and Guyana. The first table shows general energy consumption across four categories, cooking, water heating, cooling, and appliances, and lighting. Now, energy consumption includes both electricity and fuel, so LPG for cooking, um, and so forth. The second table, however, breaks down um, the energy consumption solely into electricity consumption. As, an, as we can see here, you have majority of it falling under um, appliance and lighting, which is the darker blue color. Uh, for the, both tables, unfortunately, for Barbados, St. Lucia, and Guyana, the appliance and lighting also included cooling and water heating, but it's a fair assumption to say that the majority of this is from lighting and appliances and not cooling or, or heating water. So Montserrat's energy consumption um, it's split across five users, the domestic, commercial, industrial, street light, and own use, which is what is used within the power plant, within Moles power plant. Um, for 2022, there was an average of about, of about 3,047 consumers on the grid who utilized about 453,000 kilowatt hours of energy per month. So this leads us into considering, well, what is energy management? So energy management is the proactive and systematic man monitoring, controlling, and optimization of energy consumption to conserve and decrease your energy costs. So why is this important? Um, energy management helps to reduce the carbon emissions that contribute to global warming, which we're all experiencing right now, and can also help reduce our dependency on the increasingly limited fossil fuels. So energy consumption, energy cost reduction results from improving um, energy efficiency, changing patterns in energy use, and shifting to other energy sources. So what are the stages to improving your efficiency in your home? So the first thing you'd have to look at is actually energy conservation. So this is centered around changing your behaviors. Um, I feel like as a, a people in Montserrat, we tend to maybe leave on lights in rooms or leave on fans when we're not in the room. Um, leave on TVs while we've gone into maybe the kitchen to cook. All of these are behaviors that we'd need to m um, modify in order to actually reduce our energy consumption. The second thing is actually energy conservation. Now this looks at implementing energy efficient technologies to further reduce your consumption within your household. So things such as turning off lights and appliances when not in use, utilizing natural resources such as natural lighting, natural ventilation, and air circulation when possible, swapping out baths for showers, or generally just spending less time in the shower with the water running, um, air drying clothes when possible instead of using a dryer, or avoiding something as simple as overfilling a kettle when you're actually going to make a cup of tea. Energy efficiency now. Um, some tips are replacing your, your bulbs with LEDs, which is a program that the energy department is currently um, implementing. Installing devices to reduce consumption, such as timers or motion sensors on lights. Um, purchasing energy star rated appliances. If you have ACs in your home, setting them to a higher temperature, such as 23 to 25 degrees. This reduces the difference between the indoor and outdoor temperature and actually reduces the electricity consumption of the AC units. <laughs> okay, Linda. Um, installing a solar water heater instead of an electric or even gas heater. So 
As I said, you can swap out your old light bulbs for LEDs. Now this shows you the difference in energy consumption across incandescent halogen CFLs and LEDs. Now, I feel like most people, when CFLs came out, made that switch. So most, most people, even with our project, we realize actually have CFLs in their home. We have very few incandescent bulbs actually still coming in. But you can still see that there's a slight difference between LEDs and the CFLs as it pertains to the wattage and thus the energy use and the cost that you will pay for using these bulbs. And these are some of the labels that you can look for on appliances. So you have the Energy Star, you also have the rating which shows you if it's A, B, C, D, etc. And it will break it down as it pertains to how much kilowatt hours it uses per annum. Um, in the case of the bulb, what is the lumens or the brightness, what is the wattage? Another example of efficiency actually stems to your car. So with a regular ICE vehicle, which is the one um, in orange, a lot of the energy or the yeah, a lot of the energy is actually lost as heat. About 75 to 84% is lost as heat, which means you're actually using between 16 and 25% of the energy from the fuel to propel your vehicle. For electric vehicles, on the other hand, although you lose about 31 to 35% of it, you can recapture it with the braking system. And luckily, because Montserrat has a lot of hills, when you're going downhill and you brake, it recharges the battery. So it kind of offsets how much you lose. So in total, you actually only end up losing about 11% of the energy. So once you've implemented energy conservation methods and efficiency measures, the last one that you can then look at is renewable energy. So um, sources can be installed um, such as solar, wind, which are easy enough to mount on your rooftop. Um, I just want to point out though, that with the current setup, if you do install solar or wind, the ideal setup is for it to be wired separately to the mole installation in your house. This is from a safety perspective, um, where their system cannot currently take feedback from like a person's home. But it's not to say that you're not able to install solar on your house or wind and just have it wired in separately to feed specific items within your home. So for instance, you might want to install an AC unit, you can have that solely running off of a solar system. So um, based on that, I want to just take a quick look at the potential for solar on a house. So in Munstrat, we get about 45 peak solar hours a day, which means although the sun rises six, seven o'clock in the morning and sets around maybe five, six in the evening, um, if you assume that it, you're getting the peak amount of solar energy throughout the day, you get about four to five hours of that throughout the day. Um, so a solar system with battery storage can cost you about 3,000. It, it's coming down, solar technology is improving, the cost is dropping as well, but you know, just as a ballpark, um, it, it could cost you about 3,000 US dollars per kilowatt. Without battery storage, it might be about 1,800 um, kilowatts. 1,800 US dollars per kilowatt, sorry. So if we assume a home uses about 600 um, kilowatt hours per month, that has a daily usage of about 20 kilowatt hours. Um, if you assume an average of 4.5 uh, peaks on hours, Times an efficiency factor, you'd need a system of about 5.11 kilowatts to power your home. Um, if you assume that with this 600 kilowatt hour um, monthly usage, your bill is about 650 EC dollars, which is about 239 US. Um, a 5.11 kilowatt hour um, system without battery would cost you about 9,000 US, and this would result in a payback period of about 3.2 years. There are other systems out there that might be cheaper. Um, as I said, the technology is improving and thus getting cheaper as time progresses and also becoming more efficient. So this is not set in stone. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for her? No, Adrian? I would like to commend you on your presentation. 
But one of the factors that we actually need to consider when we're actually looking at building green homes um, is not only the electrical consumption, but we need to get into the basics of the orientation of the buildings to take advantage of the prevailing winds. Additionally, we can actually look at, um, at things like energy, low, low consumption fixtures, like low consumption toilets, low consumption um, showers. Um, we can also consider aspects such as insulating our roofs so that they don't, um, they don't absorb as much um, energy. Also, we could look at other stuff like um, the colors that we paint our buildings with, using lighter colors so that they don't absorb, you know, colors that reflect um, energy rather than absorb the heat. You know, so those are some of the items that we should consider when we're looking at the, the design uh, for greener and a more environmentally um, considerate buildings. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'll give two examples to help seal the deal for Marissa. Um, stay down, go. Um, when I first came to Montserrat, I remember when I got my first utility bill. I had been at my home. I, I had been at my home. Let me move away from it. I had been at my home for, I think, seven days in the billing period. And when I got my first bill, it was for $500. And I knew I could not afford to pay um, electricity bills that high. So I took out all the bulbs in the house. And I went and I replaced all of them with, with LED bulbs. Um, I had a big heater in the house. And I unplugged that. And I learned to bathe in the cold water, which is quite good. Very good, actually. I enjoy doing it. My bill went down to $325, $325 and stayed like that until my family came. So it, it does help to, to change in, on to the LED lights. The other thing I had worked out, I, 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 I'm actually very interested in solar um, power. And I had worked out one for my home. And the payback period was about three and a half years when I had worked it out. And think about that. At this point, we are all working. We are all able to pay those utility bills. Those are bills that will come, whether we like it or not, want it or not, now and when you have retired. If you make that investment now, when you get to the point of retirement and your income has significantly reduced, that is one less bill that you have to worry about. While you can afford to do it now, make that investment. You will never go wrong with it. I have seen people install solar units on their home, and their bills have dropped down to $40 and $50 and even less. It's an investment you will never regret. Take the bold step and get involved in it. Thank you, Marissa. We have just gotten to the end of what I, I found to be a very interesting um, set of, of lectures, if we can call it that. Um, I've not regretted it, and I hope all of you all have found tremendous value in what was presented here. And if I'm to read from my closing remarks, um, today we were gathered here to provide you with valuable information on the entire home construction process. From planning to application to disbursement to completion, we have strived to guide you and simplify the home ownership journey for every one of you. As we end this eventual, eventful day, I am honored to offer some closing remarks and to extend my heartfelt appreciation to those who have made this symposium a rounding success. First and foremost, I would like to express our deepest gratitude to the Honorable Cranston Buffon, the Minister of Agriculture, Lands, Housing and the Environment. Your insightful remarks this morning highlighted the importance of home ownership and its significance in fostering prosperous communities. We are grateful for your presence and your valuable contribution to our symposium. I also want to express our appreciation to our esteemed presenters who have dedicated their time and expertise to enlighten us on various aspects of the home construction process. 
Mr. Kenneth Castle, your thought-provoking presentation on designing one's home has undoubtedly empowered participants with the necessary knowledge to create spaces that truly reflect their dreams and aspirations. Mr. Barry Shalmers, your deep insights um, have been invaluable in, in equipping potential homeowners with the awareness and understanding needed to navigate the complexities of building their homes. Your expertise has undoubtedly paved the way for, for confident decision-making in this crucial area. A special word of gratitude to Mr. Keith Thomas of KT Engineering Consultants Limited, who traveled all the way from Antigua to be with us here today. Your wealth of experience in valuations has proven to be in, an invaluable resource for participants, offering them guidance and certainty in assessing the value of their homes. We would also like to express our sincerest appreciation to Mr. Fitzroy Bufong of Bufong & Associates for demystifying the legal aspects of home ownership. Your clarity and expertise have undoubtedly provided participants with a comprehensive understanding of the legalities involved, ensuring a smooth and secure journey towards their dream homes. Lastly, I would like to extend our gratitude to Ms. Marissa Allen from the Department of Energy for your insightful presentation on alternative forms of energy, particularly green energy. Your valuable insights into incorporating sustainable practices in home construction have inspired participants to contribute positively to our environment and embrace a greener future. We are genuinely thankful to all participants for your presence and active engagement throughout this symposium. Your willingness to learn, ask questions, and seek guidance demonstrates your commitment to making informed decisions on your home ownership journey. We hope that the information you share, we shared today has empowered you to take the necessary steps to fill, towards fulfilling your dreams of home ownership. Finally, we extend our sincerest gratitude to the dedicated team at Golden Media, Deco Lab, the Montserrat Cultural Center, Mr. Ivor Greenaway and his team at, at iTech for the audiovisual support, ZGB Radio Montserrat, and all who collaborated to make this symposium possible. Your impeccable organization, attention to, to detail, and unwavering commitment to excellence have undoubtedly contributed to the success of this event. Without your hard work, vision, and tireless effort, this symposium would certainly not have been possible. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the journey towards owning your home is one that is filled with excitement, but it can also be overwhelming. However, armed with the knowledge and insights gained from this symposium today, each and every one of you has the tools to embark on this journey confidently. Remember that Bank of Montserrat is here to support you throughout this process, providing you with personalized solutions and guidance tailored to your unique needs. We hope that today's symposium has been a source of inspiration and motivation, propelling you towards the realization of your dreams. Thank you all once again for your presence and participation, and we look forward to celebrating your milestones of home ownership in the near future. I now invite you to join us downstairs for the exhibition and to see what some of our exhibitors have to offer. Thank you, and may all of you find joy and fulfillment in your journey towards home ownership. I thank you.